Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd ask if, if folks can... <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, sorry to use a gavel there, just needed to get people's attention. Uh, welcome to meeting nine of the Board of Health, uh, to members of the board, to other members of council, and to members of the public. You can follow the agenda on your computer, your tablet, or your smartphone at www.toronto.ca slash council. The Board of Health acknowledges the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, we have a very packed room and busy house here today. Uh, for people who are watching online, uh, there is an overflow room in the rotunda of City Hall. So for people who can't get in here, there is seating and the ability to watch under the rotunda. Uh, and for those who haven't been here before, just a note at the outset, uh, this is a safe space. We're here to hear everybody's perspective. Uh, and we ask for members of the public who are here, there is no, as much as people like to, cheering or clapping or waving and all the rest. Uh, so if you see something you like or you don't like, make your jazz hands. But we try to keep this a, a quiet and safe space. Um, I'm gonna begin by seeing if there are any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. Uh, to the board, any declarations of interest? Seeing none. Can I have a confirmation of the minutes from the July 8th meeting of 2019? Moved by Director Lai, all those in favor, opposed if any, that is carried. Um, we at this point are now gonna move through the agenda to see uh, which items are held. And I'll begin item 9.1, TO health check and overview of Toronto's population health status. We're gonna hold that for a presentation and a speaker. Item HL 9.2, moving to acceptance, Toronto Public Health strategy to address vaccine hesitancy. I understand that's unanimous, I'll take his care, I'm kidding. Um, there, we have a few deputants on that, just making sure people are paying attention. Item HL 9.3, Canada's new food guide, implications and opportunities for action. Uh, would anybody like to hold that? Um, seeing none. Director Donaldson, would you like to move the recommendations? Moved by Director Donaldson. All those in favor, opposed if any, that carried. Item HL 9.4, establishment of Toronto Urban Health Fund Indigenous Review Panel, that is being held for a speaker. Item HL 9.5, Toronto Public Health Operating Budget Variance for the six months ended June 30th, 2019. Uh, would anybody like to hold that? Uh, seeing none. Uh, Director McKelvey, would, are you comfortable moving that? Moved by Director McKelvey. All those in favor, opposed if any, that is carried. Item HL 9.6, Toronto Public Health Capital Budget Variance for the six months ended June 30th, 2019. Again, would anybody like to hold that? Uh, seeing none, I'm happy to move the recommendations. All those in favor, opposed if any, carried, thank you. Item HL 9.7, Enhancement to Toronto's Public Health's 2019 Operating Budget for the Ontario Seniors Dental Care Program. Uh, would anybody like to hold that for uh, seeing none? I'm happy to move the recommendations. All those in favor, opposed if any, carried. Item HL 9.8, Toronto Public Health 2020-2029 Capital Budget and Plan Request. This is the capital budget. Uh, would anybody like to hold that item? Okay, seeing none, I'm happy to move the recommendations. All those in favor, opposed if any, carried. Item HL 9.9, .9, Toronto Public Health 2020 operating budget request. There's a confidential attachment that is being circulated. I'd like to hold that. Um, and then to the clerks, do we have a new business item to be introduced here? Uh, we have two new business items to introduce. Uh, the first is health concerns associated with vapor products. Uh, this has been circulated. Uh, there will be a presentation from the Medical Officer of Health. Uh, I need a motion to add that to the agenda. Uh, moved by Director Johnson. All those in favor, opposed, if any, carried. And then also uh, a new business item submitted from staff by the Medical Officer of Health, Canadian Institutes of Health Research, Healthy Cities Research Initiative, planning grant for implementing healthy urban policy. Can I have a motion to introduce that? 
uh, moved by Director Donaldson. All those in favor, opposed, if any, carried. Okay, we're now gonna move into the meat of the agenda. Uh, before we begin, I have a motion. We have uh, more than 30 deputants registered from one item on its own, and we have other speakers on others. Uh, so in order to accommodate everybody and, and to ensure we don't lose quorum for this tight agenda, uh, I will be moving in motion, as we often move with this many deputants, that speakers who have not pre-registered be allowed to register until 10 a.m. So people who have not yet registered, you can still register in 10 until 10, after which we will close registration, and that the length of public presentations be limited to three minutes. That will also be limited for us as members of the board. Um, I've moved that. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? Seeing none, thank you. Carried. Okay. Uh, we will now begin with the agenda. Uh, our first item is HL 9.1, TL Health Check, uh, an overview of Toronto's population health status, and we have a registered speaker. Uh, that's Andy Pringle, Chair of the Toronto Police Services Board. Uh, Andy, uh, please come on up. Oh, you know what, Andy, um, forgive me. Uh, we're actually going to do the presentation just before you depute. My apologies. Sorry to, sorry to do that. You're welcome to take that chair there as you hold. Okay. Uh, so we have a presentation first. My apologies. I'll turn it over to Dr. Davila. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We've, uh, while we're getting the appropriate presentation up on the screen for you, uh, I'll just offer some uh, words of introduction. Uh, you have before you in this report, TO Health Check, an overview of the health of Toronto's population. Um, and I'm just making, there we go, this, the presentation is up there. High level, there are three major objectives that we have as your local public health department to improve the health status of the population, to reduce disparities in the health status of the population, and to ensure that we're, we prepare for and are able to respond effectively to outbreaks and emergencies. And our ability to actually achieve on those objectives means that we have to understand what is the health status of our population and what drives it and what drives disparities. So with that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, we have Liz Corson and Sarah Collier at the back of the room there. Sarah Collier, acting manager uh, in our surveillance and epidemiology section at Toronto Public Health. They're going to take you to a, through a quick presentation of this report. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sarah Collier. I am the Acting Manager of the Surveillance and Epidemiology Unit here at Toronto Public Health. It is my pleasure to present to you today Toronto Public Health's report, TO Health Check, an overview of the health of Toronto's population. Good health is a key contributor to quality of life. In order to meet the vision of the city and of Toronto Public Health, a clear and comprehensive picture of the health of Torontonians is needed. One role of public health epidemiologists is to assess and report on the health status of the local population. Similar to how a clinician uses a diagnosis to develop a treatment plan, a health status assessment contributes to a body of information that Toronto Public Health uses to develop strategic goals that support its mandate to improve the health of our community and reduce health disparities. TO Health Check provides an overview of the key population health issues currently facing Toronto. The report is intended to guide discussion on emerging health issues and priorities Toronto, for Toronto Public Health, as well as stakeholders who have the potential to impact the health of the city. To tell the story of the health status of Torontonians, selected indicators have been grouped into 11 sections. The suite of indicators presented together in this report provide a point-in-time picture of our population's health and the context in which people live that directly and indirectly affect it. The following slides present a small selection of the many indicators presented in the report in order to give you an idea of the range of topics covered, to orient you to the types of analysis that were completed, and to give examples of some of the more pressing health issues facing Torontonians today. Collectively, Toronto is doing relatively well in terms of health and wellness. Over half of Toronto adults rate their health as excellent or very good, and life expectancy has improved. However, living longer does not mean that everyone has optimal health. It is becoming more common for people to live with some chronic diseases. Diabetes, heart disease, and dementia are increasing, in part due to the aging population. While chronic diseases, such as cancer and cardiovascular disease, 
are the leading contributors to death and disability, Toronto is in the throes of an emerging type of health issue some refer to as the diseases of despair. These health concerns include problematic alcohol and other drug use, mental health issues, and self-harm. Rates of emergency department visits for self-harm have increased, and suicide is the leading cause of death for people 18 to 39. Toronto adults are more likely to be hospitalized for conditions entirely caused by alcohol than for heart attacks. And the opioid poisoning crisis has become a critical public health issue for Toronto and continues to have devastating impacts on our community. Health is also not the same for everyone. Health and inequities are the systematic, unjust, and avoidable differences in the distribution of health status between different populations. TO Health Check reports on inequities by income, immigrant status, sexual orientation, and Indigenous identity. For example, in Toronto, people with lower incomes are at greater risk for chronic diseases, have higher rates of unfavorable health outcomes for a number of reproductive indicators, and have higher rates of premature mortality. Indigenous and LGBTQ are among those known to have poor health rooted in social determinants. And while many newcomers arrive in Toronto with good health and improve the overall health of the city, this optimal health is not always long lasting. Toronto Public Health has a mandate to reduce health inequities, and these findings play a key role in informing priority areas for action and intervention going forward. We have only begun our analysis on these differences. Using the health status report as a springboard, more advanced analytics should be used to explore, explore more complex interactions. However, to do this requires access to robust data. While this report provides an overview of the health of the city, it is also an opportunity for Toronto Public Health to take inventory on the data sources that are available, the quality of these data, and where gaps may exist. Quality data is key to quality decision making. Throughout the report, a number of data gaps are identified. For example, data on many health outcomes and risk factors cannot be broken down by some important determinants of health, like ethno-racial identity, immigrant status, and sexual orientation. There are topics and issues that have limited data, such as children's health. There are instances where the data we do have is not consistently collected or consistently available. For example, for youth, we conducted our own student survey, but these data are becoming old and cannot be compared over time or across jurisdictions. And finally, age or timeliness of data continues to be a concern. For example, mortality data available to Toronto Public Health is from 2015. And yet, there are other sources reporting on life expectancy in 2017 in other areas of Canada. Often, these gaps in data are due to information being collected through uncoordinated systems and held in silos. Opportunities exist for greater efficiencies in the way data is collected and shared, and we continue to explore these opportunities. The TO Health Check Report provides a broad array of population health indicators that reflect health determinants, risk factors, and outcomes for the three million residents of Toronto. However, we recognize that even during the time of writing, the health status has changed in the city. This report is intended to complement ongoing population health assessment reporting. Additional demographic and health status information is available on the City of Toronto and Toronto Public Health websites including the Population Health Status Indicators Dashboard, where ongoing routine reporting for key population health indicators are updated as data becomes available. The TO Health Check Report is intended to be a tool to drive the conversation across the city about the key health concerns that are affecting us and lead to the development of a coordinated solution in an effort to improve health and reduce disparities for the residents of our city. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now go to deputants, and then we'll come back to any questions of staff. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to invite Andy Pringle, chair of the Toronto Police Services Board, uh, to come to the table. Andy, sorry to bring you up twice there. Uh, so you'll have three minutes when you're ready. I know uh, that's going to be tough, but you know, we have faith. And there is a clock up on the wall to my right, if you're wondering. And whenever you're ready, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and good morning. Uh, I have uh, sent you an electronic copy of the report, so I will try to briefly do some of the highlights. 
Uh, on behalf of the Toronto Police Services Board, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today as part of your discussion of the Toronto Health Status Report. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of the Toronto Police Service and our board collaborating with Toronto Public Health and other stakeholders so that we can more effectively deal with the challenges that we're all facing, including individuals experiencing mental health and addictions issues and challenges specific to Indigenous community uh, amongst many others. We understand that in many of these areas, the problems are complex and multifaceted. There is no simple solution or quick fix. There are resource shortages, systemic barriers, and long-standing cultural and social stereotypes and assumptions, all of which make overcoming these challenges all the more difficult. But it's not always about doing better with more. It's about being more innovative, more collaborative, and more creative. And it's about building new and stronger strategic partnerships to more effectively utilize what we have in smarter and res more resourceful ways. It's about joining forces at the start of our problem solving process rather than at the end, making partnership a regularized and critical component of all that we do. The service's dynamic community-centered neighborhood officer program is an outstanding illustration of how collaboration can prevent the upstream issues from ending up as downstream challenges. Uh, these officers uh, work collaboratively to mobilize community members to deal with issues before they become crises. In February 2019, the board approved the establishment of a new Mental Health and Addictions Advisory Panel, or MHAP, and the purpose of MHAP is to review, uh, provide advice, and make recommendations to the board on an ongoing basis related to monitoring and evaluating uh, the implementation of a new forthcoming organizational mental health and addiction strategy and other matters related to policy involving mental health and addictions issues. As your report notes, the number of opioid poisonings has increased dramatically over the past five years. In, and in policing, we have most certainly seen the effects of this dramatic increase. Recognizing the need to confront the opioid crisis collaboratively and within the context of our broader approach to mental health and addictions, the board approved a motion to invite Dr. Davila to be a member of MHAP, as well as to invite her to present quarterly public, a quarterly public report to the Toronto Police Services Board on relevant uh, public health issues, including the opioid overdose crisis. Further, the board directed the chief to work with Dr. Davila to identify a Toronto Police Service representative to sit on relevant Toronto Public Health committees. Andy, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to ask you to try and wrap up in a sentence, and okay. there may be questions. And explore sharing this information. So uh, in essence, Mr. Chair, we strongly support what's being done, and we look forward to working with Toronto Public Health in the future. And as I said, you have a, a written copy of what would take 12 minutes to read. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you, and thank you for the abridged version. Uh, I suspect there may be some questions, in which case you can get in some of the other content you had. Uh, I see questions from Director Perks. You'll have, everybody's a director. Well, I, I have no direction. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much uh, for, for coming here today. It's always helpful when Toronto Public Health and the Police Service work in partnership. Uh, when I was chair of the drug strategy several years ago, uh, we had tremendous participation from uh, uh, the fellow who was then the head of the drug squad, Randy Franks, and it actually helped us to design uh, the safe injection services we have in place now. I see that in your written remarks, uh, you've recommitted to participating in that, in that process, and I'm glad to hear it. I just wanted to give you a chance to expand on that in any way, or? Well, uh, thank you, Councillor Perks, first of all. Um, the, the bottom line is the, uh, the, the, the way forward, the Toronto Modernization of the Toronto Police, which we published in uh, January 2017, really em embraces the fact that uh, we need to recommit to work with communities uh, uh, and, and a recognition that one size doesn't fit all. So different communities have different needs, different time schedules. But at essence, we want to make sure that we are working much more broadly in partnership with everybody, Toronto Public Health, uh, the various communities and community agencies. 
And that's where particularly the neighborhood officers program comes into play, where they will be embedded within the communities for a much longer period of time and will be able to work with community agencies to identify issues and challenges and work together really to prevent problems before they happen. And thank you for that. I guess I was uh, looking at something a little different, which is there's a, a formal table that includes uh, representatives from the Toronto Public Service, yes. some of the community organizations you've spoken about, and I'm hoping that what I'm hearing today is that the Toronto Police Service is committing to participating in the Toronto Drug Strategy Implementation Table. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Perks. Uh, Director Wong, you have three minutes. Thank you. Good to see you again. Um, you, in your short presentation this morning, you focus on mental health, opioid crisis, and you indicated to the board you'd be inviting the Medical Office of Health to Toronto Police Services Board. But in this report, there's significant concerns with the aging population you have not touched on. I haven't seen your written submission yet. Uh, is the Toronto Police Services Board, Toronto Police, is going to be tackling the issue of elder abuse? Because I'm seeing here on page 32 of the report, talk about elder abuse, intimate partners, violence. These are preventable. And this is what our board's mandate is. So I want to address you as the chair of the board, what is police service support about these preventable abuse towards our community? Uh, I, first of all, I think that's a very good point. Uh, even the longer written presentation, I think only makes very brief reference uh, to elderly. Um, but I think it's fair to say that uh, it's always an ongoing uh, issue for Toronto Police any time there is uh, violence against the elderly. And we recognize it's a problem and often a silent problem. And again, uh, I, I think that's why the Toronto, uh, the, the neighborhood uh, community officers and the engagement in focus tables are so important because uh, otherwise we are just responding to an issue as, as reported where the neighborhood officers should be in the communities and therefore part of those community solutions and discussions. So that, I think, uh, is, is really the number one uh, way in which uh, we would look to deal with it. But it's certainly one that we're very strongly aware of, although it, it's not specifically identified in this. The only one I didn't have a chance to get that's identified in this is uh, the outreach to the indigenous population, where there are some really indigenous populations where we have considerable challenges in that community. And so we have uh, really gone out of our way to ensure that we have representatives uh, uh, from indigenous communities on MHAP and on the Anti-Race Advisory Committee, um, which just presented uh, the other day at our board meeting on uh, collection of race-based data. So we want to make sure that in all groups that have some, some challenges, we don't want to wait to be reactive. We want to be out in front of it and proactive. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Wong. I have Director Wong Tam and then Director Lai. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Pringle, thank you very much for your deputation. I, I recognize that it was, uh, it was brief. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to just ask you to expand on the mobile crisis intervention team, uh, which, uh, which is a highly effective uh, a strategy deployed by Toronto Police, often uh, in conjunction with mental health nurses. Uh, in your letter, it states that, uh, that the coverage is now available throughout the city. Is it adequately covered throughout the city? And are there some neighborhoods that are experiencing higher volumes of calls? And are you, is your team able to adequately provide that service? Uh, I think the answer is that there's always more that can be done, Councillor. Um, uh, this has been a highly effective program over a number of years, as you know. The constraints to it, I think, are really uh, on the health, medical health side in that uh, uh, we could provide more officers if there were more health officers available. And yes, there are areas such as 51 Division, which obviously you know really well. But I think, uh, you know, we can identify uh, where the challenged areas are and those are adequately covered. Uh, you know, there is an issue around how do you deal with a 24-7 uh, as opposed to during the hours which the mental health officers work. So yes, there's much more to be done and it's an issue on our uh, agenda going forward as to how we expand that program. Uh, we know it's highly effective, but we know we could do more if we had more. The impediments are less the police than they are the health side. 
And so recognizing that you would like to have more resource, resources, and I understand in 51 Division, which is the division that covers Toronto Centre, big part of all of downtown East, really, um, what I hear is the biggest concern is that there is not adequate mental health nurses to go out. So my question is, how, uh, with your request going to the province for funding, adequate funding for these mental health nurses, uh, how, 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 how short are you uh, with respect to what you've asked the province for and what they've actually provided funding for? Uh, the crisis is, uh, the, the issues around mental health and particularly in, in some of those some more challenged downtown areas is growing. Uh, I mean, I think last year Toronto Police had 29,500 calls for people in mental distress. About 10,000 of those we handle on the phone, which means we have to attend uh, the balance of them. Um, it's a it's a, a, a real draw, and, and to the degree we can have more resources in terms of NCIT units, uh, the better. Uh, there has not been uh, as much focus on the mental health side, uh, I think, in in some ways uh, uh, as as there could be. And as I said earlier, Councillor, uh, we it is on our agenda uh, in the very uh, near future to look at how we can uh, beef up uh, these uh, units and ask for more resources. Thank you. Those are yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Lai. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Pringle, for your deputation. On page two of your speech, uh, you mentioned something about the, uh, the dynamic community-based uh, centered neighborhood officer program and uh, you know this program will be dealing with uh, issues before they become crisis. I just wonder whether you can just give us an update of uh, this program has been around for a few years and a little bit of a quick update and what are you planning to do with the new funding that uh, I think we, we've got some funding whether there's been invested in this program. Well, the, uh, like everything, it's complex. This program has been around, I, sent, I think, uh, for about uh, 10 years. Um, it, uh, it really uh, took off, though, or got uh, recommitted to uh, as part of the Transformational Task Force in 2016, uh, because as part of that, we recognize, as I said in my remarks, that uh, uh, we want to be uh, policing with the community and be centric. And so it was identified that this program, which had always been a kind of a sideline program, would be central to uh, working more closely with communities. So we started with a pilot project a year or so ago, um, and uh, it's fair to say that uh, we need about $16 million more. Uh, How much? In terms of $16 million 16 more million? if we were to roll out the program properly across the city. Now, uh, last mo uh, two weeks ago, the chief uh, recently announced an increase in the number of officers uh, committed to the program. So this will get us further down the line. But again, uh, it's not in all communities and it's not as broadly used as we would like. Part of that is a timing issue and that it takes time to train up the officers specifically as community officers, but part of it is that resource issue. Uh, actually, I think uh, doing this kind of community uh, neighborhood officer program, I think the federal government and the provincial government could, you know, they have a a job to actually to do these things too. Are there any uh, plans to ask for fund funding yes, from we, those governments? Yes, I'd, I'd say we are constantly asking. Uh, Mayor Tory is very supportive of this program and has been actively asking uh, both levels of government for further support. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for, for the deputy? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Yep. Pringle. Uh, we're now going to take this inside committee. Any questions of staff? Uh, so I'll have Director Wong. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So um, through you to the Medical Office of Health, on page, I'm just reading the, the report, page 21 of the report. I was totally shocked, Mr. Chair, to read the data that I'm going to quote here, according to the report, racialized people were more likely to have not completed high school. But what was more astonishing in this report, Mr. Chair, that this is coming before this board, that for example, Southeast Asian students were four times more likely, that's like almost 30%, not completed high school. 
So I want to ask through you, Mr. Chair, to the staff, has this data been shared with the both school board? And what are the data in terms of comparison with the school board's data? Because this is huge concern for me. So through you, Mr. Chair, uh, this is uh, the first public foray, if you will, for this health status report. Uh, we have been having some preliminary conversations with other partners in the city, uh, and I do meet regularly with our colleagues at the school boards. This certainly will be part of that agenda, and uh, I suspect will be part of our ongoing conversation for quite some time to come. I'm going to uh, turn it over to my colleagues over at the back desk to see if they have anything further to add. I think, I think you've covered it. Thank you. Okay. My second question, Mr. Chair, through you to the, the Medical Officer of Health. Dealing with, I just asked Mr. Pringle about the elder abuse. Given this recently, that murder in Scarborough of that young woman with the machete, this is about the intimate partner piece. What are we doing more? Because this is what the board's mandate is because this is absolutely unacceptable. When I heard from the community saying they saw this man chasing this woman with a machete, they didn't call the police until after the fact. Well, wait a minute here. What do we need to do more and what sources do we need to get to? So through the chair, I think there are many actions that need to be taken, some of which are within the purview and responsibility of Toronto Public Health many of which are also going to be actions that have to be taken in partnership with, uh, with uh, other city divisions and certainly with external partners uh, of which the Toronto Police Services would be one. Uh, I can tell you that what we have here at the city is a, a pretty coordinated effort in respect of intimate partner violence. We've participated along with our colleagues, uh, most notably at Social Development Finance and Administration on uh, a program in and around interpersonal uh, uh, violence and uh, we have public campaigns actively engaging with members of our public to suggest that they do have a role so that we don't see the kind of thing that you just described happen over and over again. Is there more work to do? Absolutely. Are we continuing? Yes, we are. And I think um, it is not exclusively in the purview of, of uh, Toronto Public Health. We are taking on our role in that regard, both on education fronts and we're also trying to figure out what are the evidence-informed interventions that actually prevent? We rely on our police partners, as you heard Mr. Pringle say, um, to manage the downstream consequences. Uh, but from a public health perspective, we'd like to keep it as upstream as possible and look for those um, public health interventions that actually prevent those situations from arising in the first place. This is complex stuff. Not a lot of research, unfortunately, on population level interventions, but I think that's where we have to go to the spirit of innovation, creativity, and partnership that you've just heard spoken of. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Director McKelvey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is about the use of data, and in particular, is it mapped, is it available mapped and showing you know regional differences and changes and then how is that being used to guide resources uh, thank you for the question so in this report we don't we don't do any mapping um, but in the dashboard that we displayed at the, the last slide the population health status indicator dashboard we do do mapping where the data is available, we'll look at it by neighborhood. Uh, we, uh, Toronto, Toronto Public Health operates within service delivery areas as well, so we'll look at the information by service delivery area. Oftentimes, the data is not uh, robust enough, there's not enough of a sample size for us to look at it by neighborhood, um, but where possible, we do uh, try to map. And, and how is it used to guide your resources and change where resources are being deployed? So through the chair, uh, that's exactly where we need to go. I should advise you that we, this is this kind of overall health status report is actually relatively new to us. It hasn't been done uh, um, in the last 20 years, in fact. Um, so this is precisely the reason why we wanted to put this report together. Uh, and, and I think you can appreciate as an audience here, uh, both as a board and those of you that are gathered around the room, uh, it's been interesting times, challenging times, some would even say, in respect of finances and, and the future of public health. I think this is exactly why we pull these things together, to understand what is driving the health status of Toronto, what is driving uh, disparities in health status amongst our residents, 
and how do we then use our resources to the greatest effect for the greatest number of people so that we can improve health status while reducing disparities simultaneously. Um, I think striking the balance between that which the provincial government prescribes for us and understanding what is pressing on health status and what drives disparities is exactly the challenge that's before us. And you will hear us bring that many times more in the future to this table for conversation. And what are next steps in terms of like data mining? Because right now your variables are all kind of siloed but not really looked at in a kind of interrelated basis. So is that something that would going forward start to be brought out more through future reporting? Recognizing that this is new and fantastic reports. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I think, so some of the next steps are looking at how to reduce those silos, and so we've partnered with um, an organization called ICES, which houses uh, a number of different data sources, uh, to look at how we might uh, do more, as I mentioned in the presentation, cross-cutting or robust analytics. Um, so, so we are partnering uh, with different data holders, I guess to say, um, to look at where we can improve that type of thing. We are also looking at um, opportunities for data collection. So can we advocate to different organizations who do major data collection to ask them to include certain variables, especially socio-demographic type of information. Uh, so we continue to explore those opportunities. But it does take time. Um, it, it does often take uh, changes in, in policies and procedures for, in order for that to happen. And, um, and sorry, we're just over three minutes, yeah. We can come back for a second round if people want one. Sorry about that. Um, I have Director Peter Wong and then Stephanie Donaldson and, and Kristen wong Uh Director Wong. Thank you very much for this excellent report, which I spent the whole of yesterday reading. Um, but I would really like to highlight throughout the report, uh, being a pediatrician, that all of these social determinants um, adversely affect children. And that uh, children, I think, are the most vulnerable population as a group. So as we move forward with our innovative uh, approach to programming, I just want to make sure and highlight that uh, we keep in mind that uh, children are most adversely affect, affected and that we, uh, we continue to program uh, with this in mind. Thank you. Thank you. I'll treat that as a question and a statement. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I have Director Donaldson. Thanks so much for this report. I'm, I'm looking forward to bringing it back to my colleagues at the TDSB. Um, so first of all, the, uh, the, one of the items that I found shocking was the 7% of uh, Toronto youth that are meeting the daily physical activity requirements. So my question is, how do we compare to other jurisdictions on that point? So through the chair, I don't know that I have the specific data for other jurisdictions, but suffice it to say that uh, there has been noted a trend over the last 30 years. For example, reduced uh, use of active transportation to school. That is not unique to Toronto. That has occurred uh, throughout Ontario and indeed throughout Canada. Uh, unfortunately, I, I think um, whether it's with children or with adults, um, physical activity has been largely engineered out of our daily lives. Uh, we're happy to come back with you and provide you with specific results from other jurisdictions. I'm not sure if my colleagues have that with them right now. Yes, so that information actually comes from the student survey, which I mentioned in uh, the presentation was something that Toronto Public Health took on ourselves. And so that specific data point can actually not be measured across different jurisdictions. Um, there are different uh, surveys that look at uh, youth physical activity in Ontario or across Canada, and we would see similar, as, as Dr. Davila mentioned, similar trends, declining physical activity. But that is a major data gap that we actually can't compare that student survey that we did to other jurisdictions. Which brings me to my next question. Uh, thanks for this uh, slide about what the actual, what the major data gaps are. So um, you've given the example of child health data and youth health data not being collected or not consistently available. So what do we have right now in terms of child, let's start there, data? 
That's a great question. I could probably go on for well past three minutes, but I'll keep it limited. So <laughs> for child health, um, we often, we have information where children interact with the system. So if they see, uh, if they go to the ED, if they are hospitalized, we have access to that information. Um, we have some information uh, from the early development instrument, which is done in kindergarten students, looking at developmental milestones uh, in SK students. Um, we have bits and pieces from other places uh, with children, but it is very limited. We have addressed that gap. St uh, Statistics Canada is doing a child and youth survey that's happening. They're in the field right now. That data should be available in 2021. Um, but I should note that in order to get a robust sample size, we are required to purchase an oversample of that. In terms of youth data, um, there is the Ontario uh, Student Drug Use and Health Survey, OSTIS, which um, collects, has been ongoing since the 70s, and that looks at Ontario students. And again, we have looked at purchasing a larger sample so that we can look at Toronto students. That data should be available in uh, early 2020. Thanks, and... Um, uh, and sorry. Uh, we've just passed three minutes. Sorry, Director. Okay. Um, I next have Director Wong Tan. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, and through you to the Medical Officer of Health. Um, in the report, it, there's, a, there's a specific section on page 79 that talks about mental health and the addiction uh, the, and, and the relationship to, to those uh, living with addictions. Um, it also states that you don't have enough information, but you've, you have enough there to draw the conclusions that you have. Um, what is it do you need uh, in order for you to make that a much clearer distinction? So uh, through the chair, I may pass that over to my colleagues uh, who are specifically engaged in the data front. So it would be great to have prevalence of mental health issues. So there's, there, like Sarah mentioned for children, there's great information on people who interact with the system. So in emergency department visits, hospitalizations, we don't have a lot of good information on the prevalence of anxiety disorders, the prevalence of depression, and the prevalence of other mental health issues in the community. And, and because you don't have that information, are you, are you stipulating that people are just are not getting diagnosed and not being diagnosed properly and, and early on? There's definitely an underdiagnosis of many mental health issues. We know that for sure. But even for those people who aren't diagnosed, there aren't necessarily the best um, algorithms to capture all of those, those diagnoses through the medical system. So again, we need to work a little bit harder on our partnerships with ICES, who, who Sarah mentioned, to um, develop better ways to, to capture the prevalence of, of those illnesses. But this is probably not a new area of research. Um, our, the largest uh, mental health hospital uh, in Ontario is situated right in the city of Toronto. They get hundreds of millions of dollars in research. Isn't there enough money out there to do this research and to collect this data? Like, why are we still short on information here? Well, through the chair, perhaps I can speak to that. Uh, there is still stigma surrounding mental health and uh, coming forward with respect to seeking help and attention. Uh, for what may be mental health conditions. I also think that as part of that stigma, you get uh, people misunderstanding um, or not actually even recognizing that the symptoms that they experience may be related to mental health conditions and they may not seek any kind of attention whatsoever. So it's a matter of the fact that people are not necessarily knowing that they are living with some type of one form of mental health or another, not necessarily because there isn't enough money out there in the research world that everyone's circling that, that particular pot of cash and still not producing the data. So through the chair, I think that's part of it. Uh, I, I don't know that that's a comprehensive picture. It's a complicated um, web of, of factors. And then finally, um, just because I know we don't have a lot of time, uh, the City of Toronto has adopted the Vision Zero strategy, trying to get to zero uh, collisions and deaths uh, through uh, enhanced road safety. Uh, in the report, it specifically talks about the fact that we've seen an alarming trend going the other way, uh, more collisions, more uh, incidents in the road, more road violence. Um, it, this report was obviously generated before the City's enhanced road safety policy, um, and there have been those who've called the, the crisis on the city streets around road violence, um, one that needs to have a public health lens. Uh, do you think that we've done enough through the city's Vision Zero uh, strategy? Uh, have we deployed that public health lens? 
Pop, that was your last question. Thank you. So through the chair, uh, there is more that needs to be done, absolutely. Uh, I think it's uh, fair to say that we are in active partnership with our transportation services colleagues. Uh, you should expect to hear more from us, more from us together on that front. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Lai. Yes. That's okay. Uh, any other questions of staff? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, we'll move this in committee for speakers and I have Director McKelvey first. Uh, I was gonna ask one of the random questions, oh. but that's fine, I can actually say it by speaking, I think as well. Um, I, if you can't measure it, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So this is a huge step in, in the right direction, uh, looking at all the publicly available sources of information out there. And I, I can only assume that it was a, a huge undertaking that involved a lot of work. So staff are to be um, highly commended in that. Um, that said, I'm really interested in the next steps on where we go with this. Um, we need to have strong recommendations on what data is missing, uh, how that data can be collected, and we do need to work with, with many partners to gather that, that information. Um, but most importantly, what I want to see with all of these all of this data that was collected is strong metrics, right? So this is this is where we are, and this is what our target needs to be next year, five years, 10 years, going forward, because um, that's the only way we can truly measure the success of our programs. And given especially um, intense budget scrutiny that we're going under, um, it's so important that we're able to show the, that these programs are working, and if they're not working, that we're able to adapt the way we're managing them to be more successful. So I am very excited by this report, but I appreciate that I probably love data more, more than most people. Um, but I, I do really wanna thank staff for this amazing effort and, um, and good bedside reading, thank you. Uh, thank you, Director McKelvey. I have Director Mulligan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you to the staff and the Medical Officer of Health for this really important report. Um, it, there's a lot in here, and it does feel rushed. I know we have time pressures this morning in particular. Um, I don't think we can let this sit as something that the board receives. Uh, if you, sorry, if you have a motion, you have to move that first. Okay, first I have some comments. Oh, okay, well, sure, move, all right, I'll start with my motion. Move the motion and I'll then you bring motion. comments, just the... Okay. The staff. I'll move my motion. Um, and it's really just, okay, well, here it is. Do I read it? Who reads it? You read it. All right. So I would, I request that the, the, the Board of Health request the federal and provincial ministries of health and Toronto based parties developing Ontario health teams to pr prioritize the collection and use of socio demographic and race based data and to commit to developing and sharing health equity and anti oppression strategies. And now, and now I'd like to speak to this motion. I want to contextualize it by saying it's just one of the many, many motions that we could and probably should be making out of a report like this. Um, and so I would like to see perhaps a follow-up report from staff that lists um, uh, what are the links to the current practices and the operating plan, what's already underway, and what are some recommendations that we need to be making ar uh, around taking action. I think each of the directors around this table has been struck by different elements of these data, uh, but our, our agenda for moving forward can't, can't just be what we happen to be struck by in this given moment. So I would like to see a, a more fulsome conversation at a future board meeting about these. In the interim, given that we've been having some very important conversations about anti-racism and anti-oppression over the last few days and few weeks, um, and you know, given the, the work that's been undertaken by the Toronto Police Service, for example, um, I think this is very important. The Ontario health teams and the health systems transformation that's underway in Ontario right now uh, m mentions some components of equity, but doesn't set out specific accountabilities for the collection and use of these data. Um, and I think it's something that is qu uh, quite achievable for parties in those teams. And I think it would show leadership on the behalf of this board to um, recommend that um, you know, the kinds of strategies that are being undertaken here in Toronto um, should be taken throughout the health care system in addition to the public health system uh, where we are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I now have Director Su Wong. To the staff, we cannot let this, I've been around long enough to know on this board that the province 
that we cannot allow data to sit, gather another desk, come back. This, these, the, the information that's been shared with us this morning should be the backbone, Mr. Chair, for this board, but more important to council. Because at the end of the day, we are supposed to be driven by data, evidence, right? Evidence. So how do we ensure the 2020 budget lens is based on this health check? Because at the end of the day, it means nothing to my community, to every citizen in this great city. Because at the end of the day, Mr. Chair, I am very, very concerned what Councilor Christian Wong Tam just talked about, that vision zero. These are preventable deaths that we just experienced in this city. And the fact of the matter here is, how do we ensure through the motion that Kate just presented to the board, not just about the Ontario healthcare team, this council has to take some responsibility because we cannot allow another death of a young woman on our streets that is preventable. So how do we ensure that when we pass our 2020 budget, we are starting that conversation, but more importantly, how do we push out to educate all the communities? We have such a diverse city. And I want to make sure the staff not sharing with the Toronto Police Services, but other agency that is not so prominent as Mr. Pringle before us this morning, that there are so many small little community that can be a partner with us, whether it's the Toronto District School Board, Toronto Catholic District School Board, but how do we make down to the smallest community that they learn about this piece? Because it may not be involving money, because oftentimes we talk about money. How do we educate people that we are more aware, right? So thank you. Thank you. Uh, other speakers? Uh, Director Lai. Actually, I wasn't going to speak, but uh, I think most of the, uh, my comments has been uh, addressed. And I just wanted to, uh, first of all, thank staff for such a comprehensive report. And uh, such a good report, if we don't put it to use and establish some next steps and how are we going to use this data to make sure that we are being proactive in doing things that we are doing uh, in Toronto. I just wanted to actually, I don't have a motion, but I'm, I'm hoping that uh, uh, these reports are being shared with some of these more important agencies and uh, so that we can go to uh, the next steps. I just wanted to zoom in uh, one lens about the seniors. I think we do really need to do a lot of uh, everybody else uh, you know, everybody has mentioned something about different, maybe the, the children, and uh, I think I like to zoom into the senior population that is, is growing, and it, this is a reality that we are, you know, uh, we are aging. So um, we wanted to maybe put some strategy based on the senior as well. So that, that's what I want. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Any other speakers? Okay. Uh, I have a few remarks. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank staff in Toronto Public Health for pulling this together. This is, as Dr. Davila mentioned, the first comprehensive report that has been undertaken on a complete overview of health status uh, in the City of Toronto. It's the first one that's been done since amalgamation. And I think at an overarching level, um, it demonstrates that old saying that in Toronto, um, an individual's postal code is a better predictor of their health than their genetic code. It's the postal code. It is the social determinants of health more than anything else. Your access to housing and affordable housing, the safety of your streets, your access to services and opportunities, that is the biggest driver of health status. And as this report has demonstrated, in our city, there are two cities that have emerged. You have one, a city that is the most livable in the world, according to The Economist, a city that is has the most construction with towers in the screen of any other city, with towers in the sky of any other city in North America, a city that has become one of the tech capitals of the world. And then you have another city where we are the inequality capital of Canada, where we are the child poverty capital of Canada, where 29% of kids in this city are living in poverty. And as this report demonstrated, where those children are concentrated in neighborhoods and racialized neighborhoods. And so, if the postal code is a bigger driver than the genetic code of health status, then we can tackle it. And I think that's, when we talk about prevention and upstream interventions being at the crux of this, it demonstrates the importance not only of services we deliver as public health, but of policy. 
It, it demonstrates the importance of a locally rooted public health unit being engaged in working with our partners at Toronto Police Services and being engaged in working with our partners in transportation services around the safety of our streets and being engaged in working with our partners in shelter support and housing and on the delivery not only of housing but the mental health services needed within it. And so this is a critical report that cannot be buried on a shelf or lost on a shelf. I think the being able to track and measure where we're succeeding and where we're failing has to guide us going forward. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Director Mulligan for moving her recommendation, which I'll be supporting, her amendment, because I think that it's critical that we also share this with our partners at the other levels of government. With that, uh, we have an amendment that's on the screen from Director Mulligan. Um, all those in favor, opposed if any, that has been carried. Thank you. Uh, and we do not need to move anything else on this item. Uh, we're now moving to item HL 9.2, moving to acceptance, Toronto Public Health's strategy to address vaccine hesitancy. We're going to begin, like the last item, with a staff presentation. We're then going to move to deputations. We have many before taking it back in committee. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Davila uh, for the presentation. And just before that and with deputations, just a reminder to all, because I know we have many people in the room and many in an overflow outside, uh, that this is a safe space for everybody and we're going to listen and respect everybody who's coming forward. But in order to do that, uh, under our procedures bylaw, nobody is allowed to make noise and, you know, run around with placards and all the rest. Rather, we're going to listen and respect everybody as we ask members of the public to do so as well. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Davila. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe uh, we're just trying to call up the presentation on the screen. And in fact, that presentation will be delivered by one of my colleagues, our Associate Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Vanita Dubé. So I think we've just found the presentation. We're just managing a few technical issues and we'll be able to take you through this presentation. And while I have the microphone, I will thank Dr. Dubé in advance for delivering this presentation. Thank you to the board for allowing this presentation. Uh, my name is Dr. Vanita Dubé, and for um, I, I do want to start by saying I have no conflicts of interest to report. I get no payment by any pharmaceutical industries. Uh, I am a, uh, an employee of the City of Toronto, so I, I think that's important to state for this uh, for this talk. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just to reiterate what vaccine hesitancy is, it is the reluctance or refusal to vaccinate despite the availability of vaccines. And it is identified as one of the top 10 global health threats by the World Health Organization for 2019. In Canada, we estimate about 20% of Canadian parents are hesitant, meaning that they're unsure about the safety and effectiveness of vaccines. I want to reiterate that this is distinct from those who are truly opposed to and against vaccinations, which make up less than 5% of the population. And uh, right now, our vaccination rates in Toronto schools are good. So this year, 94% of students 7 to 17 years of age are up to date with their measles, mumps, rubella vaccinations. Um, but if our vaccination rates decrease, it will result in pockets of unvaccinated vaccinated individuals in our city, and that can result in outbreaks. And so what we're going to present in this report is a comprehensive multi-pronged strategy to address this. Next slide, please. So there are many activities that we propose to address vaccine hesitancy uh, at the local level. Uh, we first uh, want to empower all of the stakeholders. So this includes healthcare providers, parents and adults, students and educators, and the public at, at large. We have already begun working with our healthcare provider stakeholders to tackle this issue because the healthcare provider can address the patient in a very individual, trusted, and confidential manner and can relate the importance of vaccines in a very confident and knowledgeable way. So in November, Toronto Public Health will be hosting an accredited education event on vaccinations for physicians. 
in the city. We're also working with the Ontario Medical Association to develop a toolkit for frontline providers on vaccine hesitancy. And we have recently worked with the University of Toronto and Ryerson University to enhance curriculum for medical school and nursing programs. We also think it's important to put vaccine science information into the curriculum of elementary students to provide them with solid scientific information about the importance of vaccines and to prepare them as they one day will become our future parents. We, we've also addressed restricting advertising and false messages um, and addressing the misinformation on social media and through search engines in the report. We've also made recommendations to enhance electronic record keeping and digital health solutions. This is to work with our ministry partners so that we can one day achieve uh, an electronic immunization registry. We would also recommend including vaccine coverage rates as an accountability measure for healthcare providers in the newly established Ontario health teams, again, working with our ministry colleagues. To the Ministry of Health, we've also made a recommendation to consider removing philosophical and religious exemptions. The reason for this is that in 2006, we know that our philosophical and religious exemption rate in Toronto was 0.8%, and it currently is 1.7%. There has been a slow but steady increase in non-medical exemptions in Toronto, and this has been observed in Ontario as well. At what point will the rate be so high that we will have pockets of unvaccinated individuals leading to outbreaks of measles in this city? We need to start having a conversation about this now. Uh, another recommendation is for a provincial or national vaccine injury compensation program. And so while vaccines are safe, in rare instances, serious reactions can occur. And a vaccine injury compensation program is a no-fault compensation program funded by governments that compensate individuals who are potentially harmed by vaccines. It would compensate for services such as rehab, for known side effects of vaccines, and not for unfounded claims of vaccine injury. And finally, the last recommendation I'll touch on is about increasing federal transparency regarding the safety of vaccines. We know that vaccines continue to go ongoing testing and scrutiny through surveillance um, to ensure that vaccines continue to remain safe. All serious adverse events following immunization are investigated locally by Toronto Public Health. We then report these provincially and then they're reported nationally. If a safety signal is detected about a vaccine, a vaccine is taken off the market and this has happened. Making these investigations more transparent will further show that vaccines continue to be safe. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, a multi-pronged strategy to address concerns from local and international bodies is required to address vaccine hesitancy. We need to address the misinformation of vac about vaccines that are spread on multiple flat platforms. We also need to enhance scientific and evidence-based facts about vaccines. And through healthcare providers, we need, we need to work together to support the public, parents, teachers, students to make choices to promote the health of themselves and their community. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We're going to move to deputations uh, and then we'll bring it back into committee for questions. Uh, we have 30 deputants um, and the first is Christine Kolbeck. Is Christine here? Christine, please come on up. You can take a seat there. Uh, when you're ready, you'll have three minutes. There's a clock you'll see on my right, and I'll give you a heads up if, you, if you're just passing. My name is Christine Kolbeck. I am the mother of six children. My first child, Laura, died a few hours after an adverse reaction to her vaccine. My fifth child, Carter, also suffered a severe adverse reaction to a vaccine that resulted in life-altering neurological impairment. I stand here before you today as a mother and also a former nurse to tell you that serious vaccine reactions are not just one in a million, as many people are led to believe. There are thousands of other families in Ontario who are equally devastated living experiences as mine. Our stories are not convenient. 
but they are real and they are true and they must be heard. I took my daughter Laura for her first vaccine appointment at the age of three months and she was, after she was injected, her leg became very swollen. She developed a fever and had an inconsolable high pitched scream that we were later told was an encephalitis cry. Less than 24 hours after receiving her vaccines, my life was shattered when my perfectly healthy daughter suddenly died. The cause of Laura's death was undetermined and no adverse reaction report was ever filed. After Laura's death, we were very concerned vaccines were not safe for our family, but we followed our doctor's advice and gave my next four children a few vaccines at an older age. Then at three and a half, my son Carter also suffered a similar adverse reaction. Carter screamed in pain for hours and his leg became extremely swollen. He suffered neurological impairment that impeded his ability to live a normal life. Carter suddenly died just a few months ago at the age of 23. We do not yet have any official cause of death. After two of my children have been severely adverse re uh, had adverse reactions within hours of their vaccines, I completely stopped vaccinating my children. I'm a conscientious mother and was obviously pro-vaccine and pro-science as I was also a nurse. Despite this, I am now labeled the derogatory term anti-vaxxer. My youngest child is a wonderful, healthy 15-year-old boy who is completely unvaccinated. My son speaks three languages, he excels in sports, he loves school, he has many friends, and he would be devastated if he had to leave the school system, but he can never be vaccinated. My son does not qualify for a medical exemption because he has never had an adverse reaction himself. If conscience and religious exemptions are removed, I will be forced to decide if I should risk losing yet another child or if my son will lose his right to education. This is a decision no parent should ever have to make. It's unacceptable, it's unconstitutional and immoral to force families to choose between their children's education and a medical product that carries the risk of permanent disability and death. I will appeal to every parent in Ontario and every level of government to support me in defeating any attempt to make vaccines mandatory for school attendance. I will fight this like I am fighting for my child's life because I am. Thank you very much. Um, I, so, I, we're going to see if there's any questions, but to members in the gallery, there is no clapping. Uh, so, I, ex excuse me, sir, 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 I, I'm afraid under the procedures bylaw, just to, uh, members of the public under the Board of Health procedures cannot disrupt a meeting. I ask that you respect the board's proceedings and act respectfully. Uh, sir, excuse me, sir, if people proceed, they ha will be removed, I'm afraid. We're here to hear from everybody. Uh, are there any questions of Christine? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank Our you next for those who took the time to listen today. Thank you. Our next speaker is Shannon Merrick. Shannon, you'll have three minutes when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to address my concern and disappointment in the changes proposed to tackle vaccine hesitancy. I feel that in order to speak about vaccine hesitancy, one must have an honest conversation about why a person would be vaccine hesitant one that does not assume they're ignorant and gullible enough to base their information on the opinions of celebrities and fake news on social media. Some of us have either been harmed by a vaccine or have taken the initiative to make an informed decision after having thoroughly researched the subject and weighing both the pros and the cons. As far as I have seen and experienced, there are no pros and only cons. Let me explain with my own personal experience. As a baby, my parents took me to the doctor and had me vaccinated at two, four, and six months. I suffered seizures after each dose and had full body muscle spasms that would last for hours. After my six month appointment, the spasms never left. They would present when I was excited, happy, or scared. I was never vaccinated beyond six months. When I entered school with a philosophical exemption, I was delayed, I couldn't focus, and I was always spaced out. At the same time as these developmental issues were happening, other physical issues were also occurring. I was having what can be described as arthritic symptoms in my hands. When I was only seven years old, I got my hands stuck in a pair of scissors because they froze and I was unable to move my stiff fingers. Our doctor was of no help and we discovered a private medical facility where I had a number of tests done. Aluminum, formaldehyde and diphtheria were detected in the soft tissue joints of my hands. The rest of my body was scanned for these particular substances and they were also in my reflex arc, which is a processing center of the brain, my thyroid and my liver. 
all of these substances are in the DPT vaccine, which I had received six and a half years earlier. I know what vaccines did to me. I have lasting debilitating side effects 35 years later. <clears throat> I understand there are people that have experienced um, lasting effects from contracting certain illnesses, and I'm not here to say that their pain isn't worth hearing. However, why is their life and well-being valued more than those of us who have experienced injury or death from a vaccine? Why is my right to choose for myself and my family being sacrificed for someone else's? In fact, if someone else wants to get vaccinated, then they should have that right. But so should I and every person that doesn't want to. I know not everyone has a noticeable reaction, but I believe they are far more common. They're just not reported or acknowledged. I consider myself lucky to have only had seizures, neurological and nervous system damage. Knowing my history, I still wasn't afforded a medical exemption as a child. This is because my injury uh, to the time when it was recognized, there was too large of a gap. My family doctor knows my medical history and he knows that my son is at a high risk of having a reaction like mine, but he will not write him a medical exemption because he's afraid of persecution that he would receive from doing so. Am I supposed to roll the dice with his life and just be careless? I'm not willing to do that. I will read quickly what is on the new $10 bill. Every individual is equal before and under the law and has the right to equal protection and equal benefit of that law without discrimination. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, Section 15. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions of the deputant? Uh, seeing none, thank you. Uh, next up, we have Joel Sussman. Sussman, sorry. Uh, thank you, Joel. You'll have three minutes. Before I begin, I would ask the chair, uh, in the previous motion before this uh, committee. Sorry, uh, several, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Several of the speakers exceeded three minutes, and you let them go beyond. I would ask you to apply your justice equally, sir. You, you have your three minutes. Thank you. I have not begun to speak, and the clock is at 10. Thank you for resetting the clock, sir. I am here to defend our right to informed consent, a parent's right to make medical decisions for our children, and bodily sovereignty. My wife, Margaret, and I do this in the name of our vaccine-injured son, Mark, who received three hepatitis B vaccines in grade 7. His normal brain function was compromised, shattering all our lives forever. A policy of denial. In 1984, the Federal Register, the official journal of the U.S. government containing agency rules and public notices, stated the following about the polio vaccine. Any possible doubts, whether or not well-founded, cannot be allowed to exist. Here's a quote. It has become increasingly clear that medical revisionism is at the root of this hysteria. By this, I mean the manipulation of historical and epidemiological facts in order to drive a specific agenda. The agenda is about inflating the fear of ordinary beneficial childhood diseases while denying vaccine risks and failure. Suppressed is the fact that vaccine-derived immunity wanes over time, leaving swaths of people susceptible to measles. It's about demonizing the disease in order to erase societal memory of the long-term benefit of natural herd immunity previously enjoyed by the vast majority of people now decimated by mass vaccination. Etta West, President, Vaccine Choice Canada. This statistics uh, Canada mortality table I'm holding up, the takeaway from this table is for the 20 year period between 1990 and 2009, the annual number of deaths from measles in Canada has either been zero or one. This means the chance of death by measles for any Canadian is either zero or one in, 300, one in three, uh, 33 million. The risk is infinitesimal and is actually much lower than the risk of serious damage from MMR vaccines. A summary of this agenda item stated, vaccine hesitancy, the reluctance or refusal to vaccinate despite the availability of vaccines is growing in Canada. To that I say, you never speak to the question of safety of vaccines, which is what causes the reluctance and hesitation and refusal to vaccinate in the first place. You then state it stems in large part from misinformation about vaccines that spreads on social media platforms and the internet. In April, I addressed this committee. Everything I said was scientifically verifiable information. It was not misinformation. It was missed information that you so routinely censor and desperately wish would never see the light of day. Toronto's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Eileen Davila, in the summary of her list of recommendations stated, to respond to this growing threat, Dr. Davila, there is no threat, unless you wish to claim that the Statistics Canada mortality table I just held up and quoted from is also misinformation. Vaccination is not evidence-based medicine. It is ideology and effectively a religion. We insist on science being done as the basis for our medicine. 
Let's be clear, the work of science has nothing to do with consensus. Consensus is the business of politics. My family and I will not consent to the loss of our rights and freedoms, which are guaranteed by the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, are there any questions of the deputy? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Giselle Berrybo. Uh, welcome, Giselle. Uh, you'll have three minutes, and uh, you know how to use the projector. Excellent. So you can begin whenever you're ready. Good morning. I'm here representing Vaccine Choice Canada. We advocate for informed consent and voluntary vaccination decisions. We represent thousands of families across Canada. My name is Giselle Barabo. I'm one of seven directors of Vaccine Choice Canada. We all vaccinated our children. But I am the only one who does not have a vaccine injured child. And two of my colleagues lost their children as a result of their vaccine injuries. There is much to discuss in, in your recommendations, but I will just address the issue of mandating vaccines or the removal of exemptions. On this issue, the science is a mile high, a mile wide, and a mile deep, and it's hardly settled. I have four quick points. Mandates are not necessary. There's no health emergency here. We have a, we've had 111 measles cases reported to date in this country of 37 million people. Pun intended that it's measly. No one died. Measles is generally a benign, short-term viral, viral infection, and 99.99% of measles cases fully recover. The real health care crisis, you just heard it in your first agenda item. Focus your time and your money on that. Second point, mandates won't work. Artificial herd immunity is a failed theory. Explaining this is much more complicated than one can communicate in sound bites or in mere minutes. Read the science. Third point, the vaccine schedule has not been proven safe. And pay attention here because some of you may not know this. Vaccines are classified as biologics and are exempt from the strict and extensive safety testing required of all other drugs. The result is that no childhood vaccine product licensed for use in Canada has been safety tested using the same standards required of other medical products. The medical industry uses the monitoring of adverse events following vaccination as the primary method to evaluate safety. Our passive injury reporting system for collecting data is utterly inadequate. The US system is somewhat better and their own commission study concluded fewer than 1% of adverse events are reported. Jennifer left, I will quote her, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Point number four, mandates are a violation of fundamental human rights. We don't need exemptions because mandates themselves are unconstitutional. If we don't have the most basic of rights, those of self-autonomy and bodily integrity, and the right to protect our children from known harm, what meaningful rights do we have? Few of you are even looking me in the eye. In summary, my challenge to you is threefold. Think long and hard about bringing on government-enforced medical mandates, medical treatments, because this will come back on you personally, on your children, and on your grandchildren. Second, if you want to truly reduce vaccine hesitancy, talk to us. We have produced a 16-point brochure on what will and what won't work. It's right up there, and I will leave copies for you. Third point, be careful what you wish for. Mandates can actually fuel more vaccine hesitancy. Witness what you see here. There is a reason that this is the fastest-growing movement internationally. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions for the deputant? Okay. Seeing none, thank you very much. You. Our next speaker is Skylar Hill Jackson. Uh, Thank you, Skylar, and you'll have three minutes when you're ready. Thank you. It would be nice if the uh, councillors on their cell phones would pay attention, give us the respect that we gave you. The main motivation behind compulsory vaccine initiatives is herd immunity. The idea is that the more people that are vaccinated, the more protection there will be for the whole. The public health establishment borrowed the herd immunity concept from the pre-vaccine observations of natural disease outbreaks. Then, without any apparent supporting science, officials applied the concept to vaccinations, using it not only to justify mass vaccinations, but to guilt trip anyone objecting to the nation's increasingly onerous 
vaccine mandates. However, herd immunity is undermined by high rates of vaccine failures. Hence the growing call for more and more booster shots. Vaccine immunity does not equal lifelong immunity, which is acquired after natural exposure. The Quebec measles outbreak demonstrates that even a vaccination rate over 95% didn't prevent an outbreak. Herd immunity rates are based on statistical modeling and are only projections. The reason that 50% of measles cases occurred in vaccinated children is primary or secondary vaccine failure, which means the vaccine never produced immunity or the immunity was lost over time. For most vaccines, primary and secondary failures go unnoticed because children are not being exposed to most of these infectious infections anymore. The infections children do get exposed to are whooping cough and influenza. And then vaccine failure is obvious because most cases of whooping cough and many of influenza occur in fully vaccinated children. In fact, health compromised children are at more risk from the shedding of live viruses in vaccines by other children who were recently vaccinated. Studies show that the fully vaccinated majority are as likely to be infected with and can transmit diseases as the unvaccinated minority. Chickenpox cannot be eradicated both because the vaccine is not optimal and waning occurs and because the virus stays in your body permanently after vaccination or infection. By the way, the UK does not vaccinate children for chickenpox because it is a mild childhood illness and they don't want a shingles epidemic. A peer reviewed research paper titled Herd Immunity History Theory Practice concludes that the science behind the herd immunity theory is not settled. Two US legal scholars have shown that 60 years of compulsory vaccine policies have not attained herd immunity for any childhood disease. It is time to cast aside coercion in favor of voluntary choice. Perhaps Toronto Public Health would be wiser to spend more time, energy and money on proven health outcomes like ensuring children have access to nutritious food, helping families understand the disease prevention benefits of breastfeeding, helping families reduce their exposure in environmental toxins and so on. Um, you may you. choose to if look you the other way, wrap up in one sentence, you can please. never say again that you did not know. I Thank will you. not consent. Thank you very much. Are there any speakers for questions for the deputant? Seeing none, thank you. Our next speaker is Janet McNeil. Um, and I believe one of the previous deputants left some photos there. Uh, Christine, I believe your photos are still there if you want to collect them, please just for, so other deputants are not using them. I'm happy to have them here while I'm speaking. I don't have a problem with that. Okay. Thank you, Janet. You can start when you're ready. Please don't give me a warning because I've timed this so carefully, you'll just distract me if you give me a warning ahead that I'm running out of time. I spoke to you in April about some things I've learned about vaccines since becoming a grandmother. Today I want to discuss censorship. The Board of Health is being encouraged to join and amplify what's become a major movement towards severe restrictions on access to information about possible downsides to vaccination, actual risks and side effects. Google is restricting searches for this information. The censorship pace has really picked up this year. You may not know Google now has a pharmaceutical division headed up by the former head of GlaxoSmithKline's global vaccine business. GSK is one of the big four pharmaceutical companies along with Merck, Sanofi, Pasteur and Pfizer. It's pretty surprising how deeply vaccine orthodoxy continues to be accepted among us when you consider that the very industry that brought us thalidomide, Vioxx, the opioid crisis and many other drug scandals is the exact one we put our trust in to make vaccines and that they were released by US Congress in 1986 for liability for any harms their vaccines cause. Seems like some pretty serious cognitive dissonance as it work here. You do know the Toronto library system is already deliberately restricting books about vaccines available to its reading public. Earlier this year, I and others asked the library to buy some informative books about vaccines, one of them a bestseller from the day of its publication. 
I was told books by MDs would be favored, which doesn't really make sense, given that anyone can do deep research and publish a compelling book. I put in a request for five books, two of them by MDs. No dice, not one has been added to the library collection. I can read Mein Kampf at the Toronto Library, but not Dr. Suzanne Humphrey's book, Dissolving Illusions, Disease Vaccines and the Forgotten History, or Dr. Richard Moskowitz's book, Vaccines, a Reappraisal, or Neil Miller's Vaccine Safety Manual for Concerned Families and Health Practitioners. About a week later, I put in a request for a book about the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear accident. That one came in lickety-split. Our library system here in Toronto practicing active censorship and restriction of information. Are you really okay with that? Seems to me like a pretty slippery slope. Those of us who've done our research know there is plentiful scientific evidence about risks and harms associated with vaccines. Hey, just read a vaccine insert before they start trimming information out of them, that is. When you follow the money regarding the role of the pharmaceutical industry in vaccines in modern healthcare, what do you find? A hugely profitable industry. Profits skyrocketing. Measles scares are very good for Merck. And no incentive to make vac vaccines safer or more effective given that 1986 release from liability. Please do some research into the pharmaceutical industry lobbying that took place in New Brunswick this year. I provided a link in my letter of 20 questions sent to you last week. Um, I'd ask you just to wrap up in a sentence. You're just over three minutes. Thank you. We are all entitled to bodily integrity and the right to refuse medical procedures we have reason to fear may cause us or our children harm. This must never interfere with our children's right to receive a public education. We are also entitled to the free and open circulation of information. These are our rights in a free and democratic society. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the deputant? Thank you. Seeing none. Um, our next speaker is Linda Merrick, but could I just ask, Christine Kolbeck, your photos are still there. It's a public table, and so I'd just ask if you collect them, please, because... Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I don't want to forget Christine. And so our next speaker is Linda Merrick. Thank you. Welcome, Linda. Uh, I'm sure you know the drill now, having heard I it do, from folks. I you do, have three minutes. I do about 1% of books available on injury. Okay, I began my vaccine research 36 years ago. I went to hear Dr. Robert Mendelson, a pediatrician, speak on MMR. After 30 years of giving shots, he noticed the same number of kids got measles, whether vaccinated or not, and the vaccinated kids were sicker. He said there were no benefits, only risks. We were injecting latent retroviruses into our children to emerge later as autoimmune diseases like cancer. I determined never to give the MMR shot to my baby. I bought his book, How to Raise a Healthy Child in Spite of Your Doctor, but didn't read it right away. Because he didn't mention DBT in his lecture, my daughter got those shots. She screamed for four hours straight, staring with dilated eyes. Everyone said, that's normal. So I took her back for two more assaults on her body. She developed many seizures where her whole body vibrated. When I finally read Dr. Mendelssohn's book, I learned the DPT shot was as bad as the MMR. The screaming and seizures were caused by the vaccine affecting her nervous system, resulting in learning and physical disabilities. My next child did not get DPT shots. He did catch whooping cough from two vaccinated children who came to our house, but he recovered quickly and their, their coughs lasted for four months. Not knowing Dr. M had changed his stance on tetanus, I took my son Jonathan to get a tetanus shot at four years old. He went out to play and within an hour, neighbors carried him home because he couldn't walk. He literally had walk knee and couldn't bend one leg. He looked at me with reproach and said, mommy, why did you let that man do this to me? For a week, he dragged his leg trying to bend it. The effect gradually wore off, but he recently told me he thought he would never run again. That was his one and only shot, and he's a healthy 33-year-old. New scenario, my daughter Shannon, seventh birthday. Kids eating and painting faces. Next day, Patsy's party, same thing. Third day, vaccinated Patsy gets measles. Unvaxed Shannon doesn't, but she gets sent home from school for a week. Patsy was contagious at our house, so Shannon should have got them. Back to school for a day and one more measles case, another week off, and then two more later on. I thought she might miss the whole year, so I phoned Queen's Park and I got a hearing. I lectured for two hours and gave out 16 pages on vaccine injury. The court reporter thanked me. She had never heard any of this and had a new baby. 
A Toronto Star reporter was there, and the next day, CBC interviewed me. My phone rang off the hook. Parents asking for help. I called Etta, who had lobbied for the exemption in 1984, and a support group was started, the grassroots beginning of Vaccine Choice Canada, a website where science-based facts are presented along with heartbreaking stories of vaccine injuries. I met a lady whose baby died the day he received his six-week shot, but the coroner put SIDS on the death certificate. The stats are definitely flawed. A quote, there is evidence to prove that immunization of children does more harm than good. Dr. J. Anthony Morris, formerly Chief Vaccine Control Officer at the FDA. To vaccinate or not vaccinate, when it comes to invasive... No, I'll just ask you to finish in a sentence as you're over three minutes. That's all I have left. We need to have a choice or democracy ceases to exist, and I hope no one ever has to hear the words I will never forget. Mommy, why did you let that man do this to me? Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Are there any questions? Seeing none. Our next speaker and is Emanuela Keres. My apologies if I mispronounce that. Is there an Eman Emanuela here? Emanuela, but good, good try. Okay, thank you. Uh, please have a seat. I think you probably know the drill now. Yes. Thank you. Good morning. I have three unvaccinated children. I am here to defend our right to informed consent and a parent's right to not have their child drugged in order to go to school. I have read manufacturer inserts. The MMR has listed under adverse reactions, type 1 diabetes, anaphylaxis. The PDSL insert states sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS, has occurred in infants following administration of DTaP vaccines. Worst of all, of course, is section 13.1 that states, this product has not been evaluated for the potential to cause carcinogenicity, genotoxicity, or impairment of fertility. I am not willing to subject this type of harm over benign childhood illnesses. Would these adverse reactions be better than the chicken pox my kids so easily live through? I think not. All three of my daughters were competitive swimmers and are competitive canoe kayakers. They've competed in high school sports, getting gold at offsite, headed yearbook committees, student councils, they win academic awards, athletic awards, scholarships, and all look forward to a very, very bright future. They are productive, healthy, happy people that give more than they take. Their teachers tell me constantly how blessed I am to have them, some even asking me what makes them so. What is my parenting secret? I tell you this today not because I want to brag, trust me, although I do, but because these are the very students Toronto Board of Health is wanting to remove from our schools. My freedoms were endowed to me by my creator. The Charter of Rights and Freedoms is there to remind elected and non-elected officials of that should you breach that scope. But you already have. By requiring written and notarized exemptions coupled with your zero conversion propaganda classes, you have already overstepped your boundaries. As per, the, as per the Nuremberg Code, the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. I applaud you wanting to remove the philosophical and religious exemptions, and I ask that you remove the medical ones as well. Vaccination is voluntary in Canada and is simple. No thank you is all that is required. I always tell my kids to say no to drugs because we all have the freedom to refuse to have our skin broken, our bodies assaulted with an injection against our will. We do not want MRC5 or WI38 derived from aborted fetuses, aluminum, neomycin, formaldehyde, thimerosal, polysorbate 80, glyphosate, and sucrose into our bodies. In 2017, Robert De Niro and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. offered 100,000 to anyone who could provide proof vaccines are safe. The prize went unclaimed. Currently, Dr. Shiva Ayadurai, a four-time MIT graduate, has offered his $10 million building in Cambridge, Massachusetts, to anyone who can show him a risk assessment model for vaccine safety, allowing any parent to decide based on their kid's particular biology the risk of giving the current mandated schedule of vaccines. The, Will you accept that challenge? Okay. Removing vaccine information... I'm just going to ask you to wrap up with one sentence. Over three well, minutes. Then I do not consent to having myself nor my children forced vaccinated, drugged, and medically, medically induced in order to attend public schools. In Thank you very much. Do not. Thank you. Any questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you. Our next speaker is Darlene Owen. Darlene. Darlene Owen. Darlene's coming, great. Welcome, Darlene. 
I think you know the drill. You have three minutes. Thank you. I am here today, I'm a registered nurse, and I'm here as a Canadian citizen who believes and supports bodily autonomy and the right to informed consent. I am here to speak to the removal of the exemptions and the issue of vaccine safety. Vaccination is an invasive medical procedure which carries risks. Any effort to make vaccinations mandatory contravenes the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We are permitted to question or opt out out of any medical procedure that a healthcare provider recommends, so why should the choice to not vaccinate be any different? On April 8, 2019, our Associate Medical of Office of Health presented that 70% of parents are concerned about the side effects of vaccines. 20% are vaccine hesitant. So I have to ask you, where are the studies to quell the concerns that the vaccine hesitant parents have? Where are the studies that show that vaccines are safe and effective? Many parents have written to Health Canada requesting evidence of these studies and we have been repeatedly given standard responses that do not disclose any safety studies. The only safety studies that seem to exist are those who are fully funded by the pharmaceutical companies. How is that not considered a conflict of interest? How can the issue of addressing vaccine hesitancy possibly be taken seriously when you are recommending financial incentives to be offered to healthcare providers? You cannot continue to repeat the slogan safe and effective when there are thousands of studies within the medical literature done by independent researchers that demonstrates there are serious detrimental side effects that result directly from vaccines, one of which includes death. As for the question pertaining to where vaccine-hesitant parents obtain their information, I know that I, as well as many other parents, refer to studies that are published in peer-reviewed medical journals. We do not refer to Dr. Google as people like to keep perpetuating. Oh, sorry, I've lost my spot here. The many parents I have met who choose to opt out of vaccinating their children are highly educated. Many of them are also healthcare professionals. And I'm just curious how many of you here are aware of the fact that the MMR DTaP, Hib, and Hep B vaccines have not been tested for carcinogenicity, toxicity, or for long-term adverse reactions. And that information is not misinformation. It is found right in the vaccine manufacturer's inserts. The safety of the CDC's childhood vaccination schedule has never been affirmed in any clinical studies to be safe. So how can you truly believe that you are acting in every child's best interests by mandating vaccines? Just since 1988, the National Vaccine Injury <coughs> Compensation has paid out approximately $4.2 billion to victims of vaccine injury and their families. Sorry, I'm completely lost here. I had a five-minute speech prepared. Um, uh, you're just over three minutes. I'll ask you if you maybe want to wrap up in a sentence. Yep. Thank you. All I'm saying is that if vaccines become mandatory and a compensation program is imposed, then the manufacturer will have zero product liability and they will have no incentive to improve product safety. And I just want to close with stating that the Canadian public, through our Constitution, has the right to informed consent, and that includes the right of refusal to any medical procedures of any kind, including vaccination. Thank you, Thank you. very much. Are there any questions for the speaker? Seeing none, our next speaker is Alexandra Harrison. Alexandra, welcome. Hi. Uh, you'll have three minutes when you're ready. Okay. My five-year-old son, Grayson, is severely neurologically injured from vaccines, and today I'll be talking as a mother of a vaccine-injured child and one that would give the world to have been vaccine-hesitant five years ago. As you speak of misinformation, in April, I attended the Open Caucus for Canadian Vaccine Hesitancy in Ottawa. I was flawed at the inaccurate information the panel used to reassure parents on vaccines. After emailing Canada Chief's medical officer, she responded agreeing the information was incorrect, but failed to publicly correct the misinformation given that day and in public health pamphlets. My son's doctor said if Grayson gets another vaccine, it will be like lighting a match inside his brain. However, due to the immense pressure doctors receive, he is scared to write the medical exemption. This leaves only the personal belief exemption, which he has. But if taken away, the vaccines will not have only stripped away his opportunity to thrive in life, but also his ability to attend school. Often I hear that children with exemptions are putting immune-compromised children at risk. I have yet to hear of a single case in Canada where an immune-compromised child got an infectious disease directly from a child with an exemption. However, 
the personal stories and vaccine injury databases are examples of thousands of children being injured by vaccines yearly. So essentially, you're trading one vulnerable group of children that so far have very little to no proof that removing these exemptions will help them for another group of vulnerable children where many already have the proof of injury and a strong likelihood of reoccurrence. I'm here to tell you you've got this wrong. By taking away exemptions, you're not protecting our babies. You are killing and injuring them. And for what purpose? Do you think infectious disease stops at the school gates? That if you stop in vaccinated children going to school that they won't go out in public again? I'd love to see the studies that state measles only infects children on school property. And if that study doesn't exist, then this whole theory of yours is flawed and useless. It's, compar it's comparable to locking up a prison for only half of the day and expecting no one to escape. When it comes to herd immunity, the only part of that term I agree with is herd. It's really quite genius, the vaccine companies. Take our product that has zero liability, but just know it will only work for you if everybody else buys it too. So then the herd sleepwalk themselves to all line up for their shot of known poisons and neurotoxins, and when they still get sick, they blame it on the people that didn't do the exact same thing as them. Everybody is thinking the same thing, yet no one is thinking at all. Parents do this because everybody else is doing it. Have you seen everybody else's children? 1986, 12.8% of children had a chronic disease. 2019, 54% of children have a chronic disease. If this was truly about public health, then why are we not stood here discussing banning cigarettes and mandating organic food? I will spend the rest of my life trying to fix what people like yourselves indirectly brought by not informing, enforcing informed consent at doctor's offices for new, trusting parents like myself. That was naive of me, of us. But if you think you can do it all again in front of our faces now we know the truth, then it is no longer us that have been the naive ones. Our faith in what happened to our children is unshakable, and it would be a mistake to think that we won't protect that part of our children with, that the vaccines didn't take with everything we have every step of the way. ask you to wrap up, please. Last sentence. The price of their safety isn't going on sale. I am screaming at the top of my voice inside for you to please not do this and allow us to spend our time fighting to get back um, our babies as opposed to fighting you Thank you from very taking much. what's left of them. Thank you. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, our next speaker is Jill Promoli. Jill, you can come up, please. Jill, you'll have three minutes, uh, and I think you probably know the drill. Hi, everyone. My name is Jill Promoli. I live in Mississauga now and previously lived in Toronto. All three of our children were born at Sunnybrook Hospital. Three years ago, we lost our son Jude following a flu outbreak at our school. On Monday, May 2nd, 2016, I received a call from my daughter's kindergarten teacher telling me that she suddenly developed a fever. It was at that point that I learned that there had been a nasty bug going through the class for several weeks and it had already affected most of the kids, some fairly seriously. Isla was better in less than 24 hours and we kept her home until Thursday to make sure we wouldn't further spread infection. On Friday, May 6th, Jude, one of my two-year-old twins, woke up with a low-grade fever but showed no other symptoms. He died that afternoon during his nap, three feet away from his brother. The cause of death later confirmed as influenza B causing cardiac arrest. Jude had otherwise been perfectly healthy, never giving us cause for concern. We've always vaccinated on schedule, including the annual flu shot. Jude had received his flu shot six months earlier. While we know vaccination is our best first defense against preventable illnesses, we also know that a certain percentage of people will fail to develop immunity from their own vaccinations. We can't predict who those people will be. Three years ago, it was Jude, and he's gone now because of that, and because the vaccination rate for flu in our region wasn't high enough to stop the disease from spreading in our community and reaching him. We can see how quickly illness in the classroom can impact not only the other students in the class, but also their families who they may take it home to, and also to others in the community. When we make a decision about whether or not to vaccinate our children, we aren't only deciding whether we're willing to risk our own kids contracting a preventable disease, we're also making a decision for other families that will either increase or decrease the level of risk we're posing on them. Vaccination isn't simply a personal choice, but a public one, because it's a choice that impacts every single person we come in contact with. We aren't vaccinating children against these diseases because they're inconvenient, but because when we don't, people die. Vaccine hesitancy is a growing problem today. There's a great deal of misinformation about vaccination, and often the loudest voices in the conversation are the most extreme. We all want what's best for our kids, and with so much doubt planted, many parents feel unsure about what that is. We can't be complacent in the face of this trend. With increasing numbers of people choosing not to vaccinate, either fully or in part, we're seeing larger holes in the vaccine safety net that prevents diseases from spreading throughout our population. We all know the kids are wonderful, but let's be honest, sometimes they're disgusting. 
They wipe their noses with their hands, they lick things, they touch each other. They often forget to cover their coughs and sneezes. And a classroom full of young ones doing this sets up an environment where disease can spread easily. And that's why we need to do a better job together of vaccinating as a first defense against illness. This is particularly important for kids in our schools who are at higher risk because of underlying health issues like asthma, congenital heart defect, or diabetes. While children are already more susceptible to the more serious effects of preventable disease because of their age, there are kids in our public school system who carry an extra vulnerability, whose right to receive an education should not be diminished by the increased risk and worry brought in by preventable outbreaks that have the greater potential to put them in serious harm. Every child has the right to a safe and healthy learning environment. Jill, you're just over three minutes. I'm oh, thank you. To you. Close in a sentence. Okay. Uh, let's see. We know how to keep our family safe. It's time to put that knowledge into practice. Thank you. Uh, any questions for, for Jill, the deputant? Seeing none, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Trina Thornhill. Trina's here. Welcome, Trina. When you're ready, thanks. You have three minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> so thank you for the opportunity to come and speak with you today. The uh, topic of vaccines and vaccine hesitancy has been getting a lot of media attention. Unfortunately, sorry. Unfortunately, by careful manipulation of media, they are trying to successfully divide a population against itself in fear through misinformation. I'm here to defend our right to informed consent, a parent's right to make medical decisions for their children, and body sovereignty. In 2009, I was pregnant with my first child, being fully vaccinated, or according to um, government standards, being fully vaccinated at that time. I never questioned vaccines or vaccine safety, and I blindly trusted. So when I was told I needed the flu shot to protect my unborn child, I trusted and took that shot. My health began to change after the flu shot. I was assessed for fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis. Things got worse. Food intolerances developed, facial paralysis, projectile vomiting beef and egg. I developed allergy to penicillin, and then I had adverse re events to all antibiotics, so I can't use them anymore. I was informed by a Canadian medical doctor that neomycin, egg, and bovine are actually in that flu vaccine. What I did not know was this vaccine was not approved for us. It was not approved for use during pregnancy. Myself and other women were the test subjects. I was not and provided at all informed consent. Fast forward to this year in Washington, D.C., February 11, 2019, in response to the Freedom of Information Act lawsuit, the FDA has admitted for the first time the government agencies, including the CDC, are recommending vaccines for pregnant women and have neither been licensed for pregnant mothers by the FDA nor tested for, clinical, nor tested for safety in clinical trials. The manufacturers of the flu and the DTAP vaccines warn against their use for pregnant mothers since their safety has not been established. Package inserts state that this is not known whether the vaccines will harm the unborn baby, and there is significant data on the use of, of using this within, for pregnant women to inform, uh, to inform vaccine associated risks. Long term safety studies have not been designed to detect vaccine related fetal injuries, but a 2017 Fraser study of over 45,000 women published in the JAMA Pediatrics showed us elevated risk of birth defects and a 20% higher risk of autism in children whose mothers received a first semester flu shot. When did I get mine? First semester. So now I will address the Toronto Board of Health. Each one of you have a platform here. You are to support new people new to Canada, Canada, support and fight for equality, children, the environment, the marginalized, the same rights for all. You want that for everybody. What are we doing here trying to remove exemptions for those who actually did what was required of us and then had an adverse event to that vaccine? So no one in this office, no one right now is actually up to date, not one of you. We are all not up to our children's schedule. Do you understand what that means? You're asking for our children to have more vaccines given to them than we ourselves were ever given. So my question to you is, a doctor needs consent, nurses needs consent, a pharmacist needs consent. We do not need consent to say no. Who is going to write your exemptions? Who is legally allowed to ensure us we all need permission to say no? Mary, you're just over three minutes. I'm okay, going to ask you to wrap in a sentence. Thank you very much. Either stand behind your recommendations and take personal responsibility for the consequences of vaccination or stand down. I do not consent. Thank you, Trina. Any questions? Seeing none. Our next speaker is Tamara Ugolini. Is Tamara here? My apologies if I mispronounce that, Tamara. Uh, you'll have three minutes whenever you're ready.
Thank you. Good morning. My name is Tamara Ugolini, and I am here to defend our right to informed consent, a parent's right to make medical choices for their children, and bodily sovereignty. For several years, public health has been unlawfully suspending children under the ISPA. In Ontario, legally, only a principal can suspend a child under the Education Act, and nowhere under this Act is it noted that an entirely separate ministry has the ability to do this. When the, minister, the Medical Officer of Health's authority is in question, we have seen public health across Ontario pressure principals into calling CAS, withholding busing, and ostracizing completely healthy children by restricting them to the office and withholding their recess. This is bullying and coercion, and it is wrong. We don't send our children to public health to learn their ABCs or 123s, just as we don't send our children to public school so they can receive medical procedures or have one-sided vaccine data pushed on them. As a Canadian citizen, it is my fundamental right to exercise freedom of medical choice. It is an infringement on said right that I require an affidavit to opt out of a questionable medical procedure with horribly inadequate safety data. The exemption process violates our chartered rights. Newfoundland and Labrador, for instance, have no exemption process in place, and yet they have the highest vaccine uptake in the country. Uh, public health's agenda today provides no research into why parents may be hesitant. It makes no attempt to answer any of the questions requested of Theresa Tam in November of 2018 to provide concerned parents with vaccine safety data, including the safety of injected aluminum, long-term clinical trials, and the tr lack of true saline placebos. This is not about misinformation. This is about missing information. For instance, grade seven consent forms were sent out these last few weeks by public health to schools across Ontario. Nowhere in these consent forms do they mention informed consent, provide any monographs, or that there is an exemption process in place. They use words like required and mandatory to coerce compliance. Then strategy section E, you know clearly the Canadian Code of Advertising Standard, responsible for, for prohibiting inaccurate and misleading advertisements, and yet here you are making statements like vaccines are required and mandatory. Who holds you accountable for these misleading statements and inaccurate verbiage. Furthermore, public health has the audacity to propose censorship of social media pages and search engines, remove vaccine monographs, stating that they're confusing and required, they're not required for informed consent. The first element of informed consent is that it is voluntary, and the third is to properly inform the patient. And yet here you are attempting to censor that, and I have to just continue on. Is it any wonder there is mounting distrust of public health, a ministry that expects you to give them all of your information and then utilize it on their various platforms, and yet simultaneously removes freedom of speech, infringes on your fun fundamental rights, and intentionally censors informed consent? So when Theresa Tam can provide us with the safety up. data, when Big Pharma is not directly, directly influencing what our medical professionals learn and recommend, perhaps then we can address the reason for vaccine hesitancy. And as per your agenda here today, I do not consent. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Are there any questions of the deputant? Seeing none, our next speaker is Sandra Wang. Sandra here. Welcome, Sandra. Uh, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Sandra Huang, and I'm a concerned parent. But today, I am here to share a letter written by an Ontario lawyer and mother. Dear board members, 25 years ago, my husband and I watched helplessly as our four-month-old baby suffered a severe vaccine injury. He had seizures following his DPT vaccine. Before the shots were administered, we were not given information about adverse events and how to identify or report them. My son suffers from neurological and other problems. His special care costs tens of thousands of dollars every year. He is 25, lives at home, needs support workers and 24-7 supervision. He cannot cross the road on his own. He is taken to parks or the library where he reads Thomas the Tank Engine books. He is very sensitive to sounds. Sometimes hearing running tap water is painful. He has obsessions and listens to the same song over and over and over again. This should have been the prime of his life, college, work, friendships. Instead, he sits alone, blowing soap bubbles like a three-year-old, an eternal child in an adult's body. 
We spent hours researching therapies, traveled across North America to specialists, left careers behind. We are the full-time caregivers of a severely disabled son. Ours is not a one in a million story. Vaccine injuries are rarely reported. Are you aware that Ontario and Toronto Public Health have a history of underreporting vaccine adverse events? According to the 2014 Auditor General's report, Ontario's 2012 adverse event rate was half the national average rate. And how is it that in 2013, Toronto Public Health, with 21% of Ontario's population, reported only 9% of Ontario's adverse events? In the U.S., $4 billion have been paid to thousands injured by the vaccines that you want to mandate. You will not win parents' trust by pushing for compulsory vaccines. You will not win trust by pretending that vaccines have no safety and efficacy problems. You will not win trust by censoring social media and search engines. You will not win trust by saying that reports of vaccine injury are misinformation. It is unconscionable to censor the speech of someone injured by a pharmaceutical product. It is unconscionable to silence the victims. What is before you is not a public health policy. It is a travesty. As a lawyer, I believe the recommendations before you, directly or indirectly, violate rights protected by federal, provincial, and international legislation, including the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Ontario Health Care Consent Act. It is reminiscent of dark regimes that had no respect for individual freedoms. As per your agenda, I do not consent, and I urge you to vote against this strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> thank you. Are any, any questions of the deputant? Okay. Seeing none, uh, our next speaker is Safia Ibrahim. Uh, Safia, if you could come up. Uh, you'll have three minutes when you're ready. Thank you. Good morning. Members of the board, my name is Safi Ibrahim, and as a polio survivor, UNICEF Canada Special Representative on Vaccines, a support of Immunize Canada, and a mother of three children who live in this city, I strongly support access, access to vaccinations. I know and live with the impacts of that right being taken away. Through my support of UNICEF, I see the multiplier effect of this basic yet crucial public health intervention and the lives of children that are saved each year. And this is why vaccine hesitancy risks all children's health and lives. Hesitancy risks my life. It is concerning to me to hear that there are five times the measles cases in Canada than this time last year when we had vaccine, when we have a vaccine to prevent this unnecessary illness. Vaccines don't just protect people getting vaccinated. They protect everyone else as well. The more people in the community who are vaccinated, the harder it is for a disease to spread. If a person is infected with a disease, comes in contact with only people who are immune, the disease will have little opportunity to spread. Her, um, and the type of protection created when most people are immunized is called herd immunity. It means that many of us are protecting each other, especially the most vulnerable among us. Knowing this fact that is based on science and research, I can help but worry when I receive a notice in the first, when I receive the notice in the first week of school regarding a child with a, with a serious illness in my son's second grade class. It read, dear parents of the second grade class, I would like to inform you that there's a student in the class who has a serious illness. In order to protect it at best, it is our expectation that if your child gets chicken pox or measles, you will and should report it immediately to the school. Like it, likewise, any other cold or any cold or any flu that should also be reported to the teachers. I think that you understand the importance of this message and I know you could I could count on your cooperation on this. I wish you a beautiful weekend, the principal. I am not only concerned for this child, but the parents as well. As a mother, I could only imagine the fear they experience whenever their child goes out into the community, whether it's to school or to the playground. Vaccines have saved more lives in Canada than any other medical intervention in the past 50 years. Before vaccines were available, many Canadians died from diseases that we can now prevent. Vaccines also prevent diseases that, that are deadly but can cause pain and permanent disability like polio. 
I understand parents of today haven't seen how polio can destroy a family and alter a child's life. So the urgency to vaccinate is unmet. But when immunizations drop in a community, it's easier for a disease, disease to spread from person to person and cause an outbreak. By the way, the polio virus is still found in other parts of the world and can be reintroduced to Toronto through travel and migration. As I said earlier this morning, I myself, being the result of a vaccine has- Safia, you're just over three minutes, so I'm gonna to have to ask you to wrap up your last sentence, okay. thank you. Thank you, um, Toronto Public Health, councillors and members of the board for allowing me to speak and be part of this important conversation. Thank you very much. Are there any questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Amanda Moses. Is Amanda here? Welcome, Amanda. You'll have three minutes when you're ready. All right. I'm Amanda Moses, and I left at three o'clock in the morning to drive five hours to come and speak here with you guys today. When I first became a parent, I never questioned the safety or efficacy of vaccines, so I vaccinated my first three children. After each set of vaccines, within a day or two, each of my children would become ill and would be hospitalized. My oldest started having several developmental delays and was constantly sick and has allergies and asthma. My second oldest child went from talking and developing perfectly to losing all speech and eye contact directly after a set of vaccines at 17 months old. This sudden and extreme change was seen by our family doctor and has been documented in family videos and pictures. She has been diagnosed with autism worse than 68% of children on the spectrum and will never live independently. I delayed my third child's vaccines to see if it would lessen his chance of a reaction. After his vaccines, within hours he had a seizure and after the seizure, half of his face was partially and permanently paralyzed. He talks at the side of his mouth. He went from never being sick to being chronically ill. This is why 70% of parents are concerned about side effects and 20% are vaccine hesitant. It has nothing to do with what is being shared on social media. The majority of us are not anti-vaxxers, we are ex-vaxxers. When you hold your seizing child in your hands or you find your baby's lifeless body in their crib a few hours after their vaccines, there is no 20 minute video that can scare us into wanting to risk another reaction in all hopes of possibly preventing a weeks of the measles or chicken pox, which many of our parents and grandparents all had and survived unscathed. Infectious diseases are treatable, brain damage and death are not. It is clear to me now that my family has a genetic disposition making us more susceptible to being injured from vaccines, so I chose not to vaccinate my last two. These children are now six and seven and have zero developmental delays. They are the perfect picture of health. They have no asthma, allergies, or physical or mental disabilities of any kind. There are risks with vaccinating. Any doctor who has read a vaccine insert will tell you this. They will say the risk is rare, but there is a risk and it is not rare. My kids are living proof of that. No one has the right to force somebody to do something that carries along with it risks. Vaccination is not a social issue. It is a personal choice and must remain as such in a free country. What is the reason and need for this rash and disgraceful decision to try to directly defy our human and constitutional rights? Where are these supposed epidemics of children dying from infectious diseases here in Canada? If the number of people choosing to opt out on vaccinations is growing, shouldn't we be seeing epidemics? Amanda, you're just over three minutes. I'm gonna ask you to wrap okay. up in a sentence, please. So I just have a question <laughs> real quick. So since this community is, uh, committee is bringing this motion forward, I'm assuming you will all happily comply and make public your updated vaccination status like we have to. Can I get a, a commitment from all of you today that you will do this within the next two weeks to prove that you really are in integrity with what you are proposing to families across the city? I'm just gonna have to ask you to wrap up there. Thank you very much. That was just a question. Thank you. Uh, any questions of the no deputy? Answers, no replies. Thank you. Uh, our, next, our next speaker is Dr. Allison McGeer. Uh, Dr. McGeer. Uh, please come forward. You'll have three minutes whenever you're ready. Welcome, Dr. McGuire, when you're ready. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Health, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm, my name is Alison McGear and I'm an infectious disease physician uh, of the Sinai Health System and a member of the newly formed Center for Vaccine Preventable Disease at the University of Toronto. I want to declare my conflict of interest. My institution has funding for a variety of vaccine research studies from a number of the companies that make vaccines. What, sorry? You can carry I want to thank you this morning for the opportunity to uh, support the recommendations of this Toronto Public Health on a strategy to address vaccine hesitancy. As you likely know, vaccines are second only to safe food and water in their contribution to the doubling of life expectancy uh, over the last century. Give you a sense of the benefit uh, primarily of vaccines. For every one year that your parents delayed getting pregnant with you, your life expectancy increased by three months. World Health Organization uh, estimates that between two and three million lives of children are saved every year by vaccination. <laughs> but vaccines have risks and vaccine hesitancy is a new and growing problem to the extent that the World Health Organization declared in 2019 that it was one of the top 10 public health threats. It's arisen for complex reasons, including paradoxically the success of our current vaccination programs, the erosion of trust in our public systems, evolution of social media and the consolidation of vaccine production by the pharmaceutical industry. We want to commend the Toronto Public Health and the Board of Health today for taking a leadership role in addressing the challenge of vaccine hesitancy. I strongly support all of the items of the action plan put forward. Recommendations are based on solid evidence and each one of them will contribute to the effectiveness and safety of our public vaccination programs. However, it's also important to recognize that many of these recommendations have been made by many different public health bodies over the last 20 years. Their success to date in making change is limited. I would thus encourage the board and Toronto Public Health to consider how they can effectively support these recommendations going forward. This is particularly important today in the light of the recent loss of the Applied Immunization Research and Evaluation Program, the Senior Immunization Scientist and the Chief Science Officer at Public Health Ontario. Leadership and coordination and innovation in vaccination programs from our local public health units in Ontario is going to be critical to our progress in maintaining safe vaccination programs in the next few years. In the body of the report, Toronto Public Health lists a number of projects they are undertaking to support immunization knowledge and practice. These programs are all commendable and they need to be both continued and evaluated. I'd encourage the board to support continued Toronto Public Health planning to meet the challenge of vaccine hesitancy and ongoing reporting of both goals and progress over the coming years. I would also request that Toronto Public Health and the board consider how they might continue a leadership Allison, role. Allison, I'm afraid you're area. just over three minutes, so I'm going to ask you to wrap up in a sentence if you could. In particular, as Ontario's largest and most diverse public health unit, Toronto is well placed to support coordination of the efforts of partners and stakeholders and innovation in the development of programs to ensure the success of our vaccination programs for the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there any questions for the deputant? Uh, I see one. Uh, Director Perks. Thank you um, very much. Uh, you said in your remarks that many of the recommendations we have before us have been made many times and that we should uh, take further steps. Could you talk a little bit more about what kinds of further action you would like to see from the Board of Health? I think I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in how to move forward, but I, I think the the evaluation of programs is one critical area. So um, if you look at the written submissions to this board, there's a submission from the Simcoe Muskoka Public Health looking at <laughs> vaccine compensation in which they took advantage of the University of Toronto's um, public health students to do the research for those reports. So I think there is a possibility of working with a variety of different universities to, to build the evidence case for making changes. Um, I think it's probably not enough to make a single recommendation to a number of groups about what to do, but to try to make sure that there's ongoing recommendations and that you start a discussion going forward with the province and the federal government about what can be done. I think it's helpful to ask Toronto Public Health what they would like to do that they don't have the budget for and, and on their vaccine hesitancy programs, you know, what their priorities are. Um, obviously, 
budget's difficult for everybody, but I think if, if Toronto Public Health has a list of the things they want to do and you know how much they cost, there's then some practical possibility of looking for funding for those programs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Michelle James. Uh, if Michelle, if you're here. Is Michelle here? I don't see Michelle. I'll call one last time. Michelle James. Okay. Uh, after that, our next speaker is Dr. Samantha Hill. Oh, sorry. <laughs> How could you forget? You guys are watching. Uh, number 19, sorry, Rosemary Fry. Uh, Dr. Hill, you'll be next. Rosemary, you'll have three minutes when you're ready. Yeah, I'm Rosemary Frey. I'm a retired Ray, uh, medical journalist. I was um, got a master's in molecular biology from the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Calgary. I was a medical, freelance medical journalist for 22 years. And I want to point out to you the dozens of people here who have come to speak about the clear and present dangers of, of vaccines. Can you, anybody who's had, had a vaccine injury or had a vaccine in your child, can you please raise your hand? So, but um, yet we all know, well, I know, we're going to be ignored. Nothing we say will make a difference. You're not going to ask us a single question. Just like last time we came, you didn't ask a single question to us. And you compared us, uh, uh, Councillor Cressy, you compared us basically to flat earthers. And you said vaccines are safe and effective. And other people in the, on this committee made fun of us. Uh, Councillor McKelvey uh, read out a product monograph of water saying, well, water can be unsafe. So just like a product monograph of, of, of vaccines that, you know, that anything can be unsafe. So you're ridiculing people who are just trying to say, maybe do your job and don't just be trained seals for the vaccine companies. Maybe actually say, let's look at the evidence. But that's not happening today or today. I don't expect it, even though it should happen. It's, a, it's just unbelievable what's happening. It's a farce. It's a travesty. And by the way, in the press conference before I, I went sat down the press conference, and you had several speakers that were all saying, vaccines are great, we have to man make them mandatory, you know, all this. But, you know, there are dozens of people here who could have spoken to some of the problems with vaccines. Where was any voice from that? Which is, is that a little bit of censoring of information? And, uh, for example, Safia spoke uh, about how we're going to have a vaccine compensation program, where that should be done. And she said, well, that way that pharma companies will have a skin in the game because they'll have to pay. But as you heard in the presentation from the officer, from the medical people from the Department of Health, no, we as taxpayers pay. Pharma companies are off the hook. I mean, the misinformation is so deep and thick. This information that you're, the resolutions you're talking about are about misinformation. I'm now an activist and an investigative journalist. I've looked into vaccines. And indeed, I've discovered a ton of misinformation about vaccines. And almost all of that misinformation comes from public health officials, politicians, and the government, with a hidden hand of big pharma behind it to whitewash vaccines. Just look at the lobbyist registries in Ontario province or other places. They're pressing hard because we as taxpayers pay for those vaccines also. So it's just in the formularies. So it's great, huge money maker. And, you, and the media is censored. I, we just read last week this book, Stonewalled, by a former investigative journalist at CBS News. When she did a piece a few years ago about autism and vaccines, the pushback was immediate. She got the first a Merck back group that promotes childhood vaccines was protesting, then hard guns from pharmaceutical companies just flooded CBS, et cetera. So this is what we see now. That's narrow the debate. Now media will not speak out about vaccines. Because Rosemary, you're just after three me. minutes. I'd ask if you could wrap up in a sentence, please. So your proposed ban who benefits? It's big pharma, not the people. And you're just trained seals, and it's sad. That's sad to see. That's why people don't respect public health or politicians. Thank you, you very much. You want to cause anti-vaxxers, and what you're doing is, doing is opposite of protecting public health, and you know it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the deputant? Okay, seeing none, our next speaker is Dr. Samantha Hill. Uh, thank you, Samantha. You'll have three minutes when you're ready. My name is Dr. Samantha Hill, and I'm the president-elect of the Ontario Medical Association. I'm here today on behalf of 
Ontario's 31,500 doctors to say that vaccines work, vaccines are safe. I, sorry, vaccines I'm just putting your time on hold. Uh, ladies and gentlemen in the gallery, we've all been respectful of everybody's time and I'd ask us to respect the deputant. Thank you. Thank you. Vaccines work, vaccines are safe, and vaccines are vital to our community's well-being. People should not be swayed by the misinformation they hear to the contrary. Vaccines work. Vaccination is one of the most successful public health interventions in the history of mankind. It's led to the elimination and control of dangerous infectious diseases such as smallpox, polio, diphtheria and measles. Not so long ago, Canadian children were becoming severely ill and dying from these diseases. Measles, for example, can cause severe pneumonia, brain swelling, and serious problems even years after the initial infection. Children are more vulnerable and can become very sick very quickly, sometimes within hours. Vaccines are safe. All vaccines used in Canada are rigorously tested through multiple phases of trial. Once approved for use, they are carefully monitored to ensure their safety and effectiveness. In fact, it's more likely that an individual will get sick from a vaccine-preventable disease than from the vaccine itself. Vaccines are vital. In Canada, childhood immunization rates are generally high. However, vaccine coverage remains below the herd immunity target of 95% for many diseases. And this has led to the recent outbreaks of measles, mumps, rubella, and pertussis. There's a lot of misinformation circulating online. Because of this, doctors have been hearing more from patients questioning the need to get their kids vaccinated, and some are opting out. We know that parents want to make the best decisions for their children. 63% of parents admit to looking for immunization information on the internet. That's concerning because information circulating about vaccination on websites and social networks is mostly inaccurate. When it comes to the safety of our children, decisions should be made based on science, on evidence, and on advice from our family doctors, not the size of someone's fan base or a Google search. Ontario's doctors are invested in your health and in the health of our communities. That's why beginning this week, the Ontario Medical Association is launching a multi-channel social media campaign to help target the spread of the anti-vaccine myths. I encourage you to look for the hashtag AskOntarioDocs. Thank you very much. Are there any speakers of the deputant? Thank you, Dr. Hill. Or any questions? Sorry, did I say speakers? Okay. Um, our next speaker is Mike Jackson. Is Mike here? Come on up, Mike. Welcome, Mike. You'll have uh, three minutes whenever you're ready. There's a clock up to my right, if you're wondering. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mike Jackson. I work as an English language instructor to new immigrants. And every day, I proudly sing our national anthem with my students. Our anthem, O Canada. It expresses what we stand for as a nation. It expresses who we are, the true north, strong and free. I am deeply concerned because if this proposal is made law, I feel the very heart and soul of our great nation will be tarnished. We will become the true north, no longer free. Canadians will be oppressed because we will have lost the right to inform consent to medical treatment. And we won't need any outsider to oppress us anymore. I believe in God. And I believe that all human beings have sacred, inalienable rights. One of those inalienable rights is the right to inform consent regarding all associated risks with any medical procedure. To violate this right is to violate the most important part of the Nuremberg Code formed after World War II atrocities. Atrocities. I submit that this recommendation to abolish religious and philosophical exemptions and force mandatory vaccinations upon our children as a condition of receiving education is a direct assault on our fundamental freedoms guaranteed in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms under Section 2AB, Section 7, and Section 15.1. Section 7 of the Charter states, and I quote, everyone, not the majority, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and the right not to be deprived thereof except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. 
The Supreme Court of Canada has held in previous judgments, such as Rodriguez versus British Columbia, that security of the person includes, and I quote, personal autonomy, at least with respect to the right to make choices concerning one's own body, control over one's physical and psychological integrity, and basic human dignity. As such, the right to make choices concerning one's body is a human right, a charter-protected right, and a Supreme Court-recognized right, and the right that shall not be deprived except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. So what are those principles? Now, the vaccine lobby and their supporters will say that these recommendations are an example of fundamental justice. They're 100% safe and effective. The unvaccinated are going to jeopardize the lives of all of us. If this is in fact true, do these statements really withstand real scientific scrutiny? So I ask you, are there serious side effects printed on every vaccine manufacturer's product insert? Yes. If you, if I ask you this, is this information on the insert, quote, false and misleading or misinformation? <laughs> no. When I sit down and read the van ma vaccine manufacturer's product inserts, like most of the people here have done, and on that basis, I refuse to vaccinate my child. Is that now hallway medicine? No. What I find really astonishing and really disturbing is that this misinformation or hallway medicine that's supposed to be censored by this strategy is in fact any scientific evidence that actually confirms the litany of side effects already printed on the vaccine manufacturer's insert. Mr. Jackson, I'm going to have to get you to sum up just in one sentence, please. You're about time. This is not hallway medicine. I ask you very, very clearly, keep the true north strong and free. Do not accept this recommendation. If you do, we will stand on guard for thee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions of the deputant? Seeing none, we'll invite up the next one, Tanya Roca. There was a, a handout from the deputant there. Some someone, someone from the clerk's office could just grab them from Dr. Wong. Thank you very much. I'll reset the clock and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Tanya Raka. I am a lawyer, a wife, and a mother of two young boys aged three and five. My older son has an extremely rare disorder and is being treated and monitored at Sick Kids by the head of oncology. When Ms. Ibrahim stated that she could only imagine what a mother of an immune-compromised child feels like worrying about their child's health, I am that mother. And I would never ask or expect another mother or father to put their child at risk for my son's benefit. It is my job to protect him and nobody else's. As a parent and a lawyer, I, am, I strongly oppose the recommendations set forth in the report. You have my complete submissions in hard and electronic copies, and I ask you to rely on them and please read them. The staff report is supposed to recommend a strategy to address vaccine hesitancy, and it completely misses the mark. The recommendation to provide financial incentives to healthcare providers for promoting vaccines will increase vaccine hesitancy. Financial incentives create an obvious and serious conflict of interest that will only erode trust between doctors and their patients. This board should be promoting the exact opposite recommendation, that healthcare providers should be absolutely prevented from receiving financial incentives for promoting or administering vaccines or any other drug. That would give people confidence that the medical advice given to them by doctors is what is in their best interest, not for the doctor's personal financial gain. Removing non-medical exemptions under the Immunization of School Pupils Act also does not address vaccine hesitancy. Forcing vaccines is a direct violation of our Section 7 Charter Right to Life, Liberty and the Security of the Person that cannot be saved under Section 1. There is no urgent or important objective that can be achieved by this immunization to justify the infringement on bodily autonomy. Herd immunity won't be achieved by force vaccinating only children. Kids make up only a small part of the herd. That should be obvious to everyone. I turn you to my written materials where pro-vaccine Dr. Gregory Poland studies immunogenics of vaccine response and calls on public health to accept that the measles vaccine has so many drawbacks it is unworkable. 
Consent to medical treatment, including a vaccine, must be voluntary to be valid under the Health Care Consent Act. Removal of a non-medical exemption is a violation of law and disproportionately targets parents of lower socioeconomic status because they are less likely to be able to homeschool. You have a mandate to produce health inequities, yet your recommendations would increase them. Rather than strip Ontarians of their freedoms and attempts to force the vaccine hesitant into compliance, I encourage this board to engage in the discourse. Strike a standing committee that includes the vaccine hesitant. Talk with us and hear our concerns. I am here and I am willing to answer questions. I expect that you will have none of me, as has been the case for my predecessors. I don't expect you will have those questions, but I truly hope that you will prove me wrong in that regard. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Questions? Okay. Not Seeing surprised. None, thank you very much. Disappointed. Our next speaker is David E. Bronfen. David? Welcome, David. Uh, you'll have three minutes whenever you're ready. Thank you. I have three healthy, unvaccinated kids and wish to challenge the prevailing narrative by the Board of Health that parents who hesitate with childhood vaccines have been hoodwinked by false information and that they should be forced to vaccinate their kids with virtually no exceptions. Have we forgotten that vaccines are a medical intervention? Parents should not have their right to choose what's best for their kids revoked by a false portrayal of vaccine safety by public health officials. Why hasn't the Board of Health acknowledged that vaccines carry very real risks and do sometimes cause serious lifelong injuries? Please do not silence parents who make thoughtful and informed decisions to delay, minimize, or even pass on childhood vaccines. Making vaccines mandatory would be a gross violation of a parent's natural right to decide what vaccine injury risks they are willing to accept for their kids. Thank you very much, David. Uh, any questions David has left? Any questions for David? Okay, seeing none. Uh, next, I have Brittany Green. Is Brittany here? Hi, Brittany. Brittany, I'll start the clock whenever you're ready. A vaccine is a pharmaceutical product and like the majority of pharmaceutical products, it comes with side effects, some very debilitating and even deadly, as you just heard. As everyone is unique genetically and physiologically, this product affects us all differently. We know that certain children are more susceptible to vaccine-induced damage than others, but we currently have no clear way to determine which children these are. And so the vac vaccination procedure is a little bit like playing Russian roulette with our children. Something that truly saves lives and causes no harm does not need to be mandated. But this is simply not the case with vaccines. We are told the science is settled and the slogan vaccines are safe and effective is repeated over and over again. But if this is true, then why is there so much evidence to the contrary? Why is there an overwhelming number of peer reviewed studies on the toxic ingredients in vaccines and how they damage the body, in particular the aluminum adjuvants? It doesn't sound like the science is settled at all. It is often stated that vaccination rarely leads to serious adverse events, but this statement is false. A recent study done in Ontario established that vaccination actually leads to an emergency room visit for one in 168 children following their 12-month vaccination appointment and for one in 730 children following their 18-month vaccination appointment. When risk of an adverse event requiring an ER visit is high, vaccination must remain a choice for parents. If an individual or parent wishes to prevent illness by strengthening the immune system by adequate nutrition, regular consumption of clean water and good hygiene practices, then they have every right to do so. I was under the impression that we lived in a free country, but there's nothing free about forcing medicine on those who do not want it, especially one that contains toxic ingredients such as aluminum, MSG, formaldehyde, polysorbate 80, and foreign DNA particulate. 
if we do not have the freedom to choose what goes into our bodies and in the bodies of our children, then we are not free in any useful or meaningful sense. This is not moral, and fascism has no place here. This network of parents of vaccine-damaged children will never be silenced. There are rallies all over the world, and their numbers continue to grow every day. Legislation can never stop this movement. Please open your eyes and your hearts and do what is right. You can look back and be proud that you stood with the people on the right side of history. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Brittany. Uh, are there any questions of the speaker? Uh, seeing none, uh, next I have Nick DeAngelis. Is Nick here? Uh, Nick DeAngelis. Uh, one last call. Is that Nick coming forward? Yeah? Great. Welcome, Nick. If vaccines are so safe, then why does the U.S. Supreme Court classify vaccines as unavoidably unsafe? If vaccines are so safe, why are pharmaceutical companies exempt from liability? Why did the CDC vaccine schedule triple immediately following the granting of the liability exemption? Why did the childhood Ill chronic illness rate increase from 12% to 54% after the schedule tripled? If vaccine injury and death are so rare, why has over $4 billion been paid out to victims and their families through the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program in the United States with only 1% of adverse reactions even being reported? There has never been a proper study proving vaccines safe. The mainstream studies are terribly misleading to the general public and are funded by one of the most corrupt industries in the world responsible for most deaths annually. It wasn't long ago that the pharmaceutical industry created the opioid epidemic which claimed hundreds of thousands of lives and deaths from overdoses. It wasn't all that long ago doctors were convinced to promote cigarettes as safe and healthy which kills more than 480,000 people in the year in just the US. The pharmaceutical industry has been charged with bribery, criminal off-label promotion, failure to disclose safety data, paying kickbacks to physicians, extortion and murder over and over again with the lawsuits exceeding tens of billions of dollars. Why would I trust them with my health when all they care about is wealth? I can name off 35 drugs that were pulled from the shelves of the FDA. They caused death and extreme adverse reactions. These, death, these drugs were tested on four point, for an average of 4.5 years before licensing, not 4.5 days like vaccines. We are being persuaded by the members of public health to vaccinate rather than informed. Being told by authority is the worst case of evidence to vaccinate. I have a friend's brother who, who, who died following a vaccination. And it wasn't SIDS, it was the vaccine that killed him. Vaccines are, not, are linked to autoimmune disease. They are linked to neurological disease, allergies, asthma, and many other illnesses. I myself am lucky to be alive after almost dying from a doctor's prescription. There is no biological free lunch, and these drugs come with consequences. So when does medicine kill people? It's supposed to heal and revive us. No one has a higher claim over our bodies than our children's bodies and ourselves. This is fascism and will not comply. Many of us are sick in the lies and manipulation of the mainstream media funded by special interests and pharmaceutical companies. There are experts in basically every field of medical expertise and even vaccine scientists claiming they don't vaccinate or even have their kids vaccinated because the negative risks are much too great. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions for Nick? Okay, seeing none. Um, our next speaker is Amanda Doyle. Is Amanda here? Welcome, Amanda. My name is Amanda Doyle, a previous healthcare professional and a concerned mother. I applaud the recommendation uh, to consider developing a national vaccine injury compensation program to support those individuals who've had an injury from vaccine. I have a family and a friend who have been seriously vaccine injured. Without going into personal details, I'll, I know others uh, are more effective at sharing their personal stories than I am. Um, I will state that I truly value the freedom to believe in the God of the Bible and live out my faith in this country. What is the sudden emergency that makes you even consider removing these fundamental rights to religious freedom and philosophical exemptions? These are our human rights to think and act upon those thoughts, to express what we deeply believe in. These mandates without exemptions will certainly change our nation for the worse. 
In this report, there are many recommendations for action to address vaccine hesitancy. It stated the vaccine hesitancy stems in large part from misinformation about vaccines spreading on the social media platforms and internet. Here's where you're mistaken. This vaccine hesitancy movement, as you call it, was basically founded because of the fact that information has not been transparent but hidden from the public. I was surprised when I learned that ingredients such as aborted fetal cells and formaldehyde in vaccines, just to name a couple, many serious side effects such as death, different autoimmune diseases, serious injury. The fact that true scientific studies are not done on vaccines without a proper inert placebo. These are just a few of the things that are concealed from the people. The public is demanding more transparency, not less. Instead of streamlining information and limiting the safety data as recommended in item 5B, why not give full disclosure to the people to decide for themselves? You yourself gather all sorts of information and data can be limited and out of date. Vaccines fail. Vaccines are not safe. There are other ways to boost the health of our community other than vaccines that don't carry serious risk of death or injury. It's 2019 and time for public health to start promoting um, other solutions to promote real health care. Recommendations, I'd, sorry, I'd ask, <laughs> I know we can all agree on this. Our children are the future and deserve this consideration and dedicated time. I'm praying for you to maintain our freedoms in Ontario, freedom to follow our consciences and religion, freedom to parents to choose what goes into our children's bodies freedom to protect our children from possible harm, and freedom to give our children an education. Please do not remove choice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. Are there any questions for Amanda? Okay, seeing none. Uh, number 27 on the list, Andrea Robichaud has, has taken her name off the list. Uh, and then I had three more additions before the 10 a.m. cutoff. Uh, so our next speaker is Shauna Schmidt. Welcome, Shauna. Hello, my name is Shauna. I have six children, ages three to 14, and they are all completely unvaccinated. I'm gonna go off script at the, at the start here because what I've heard during the proceedings this morning, uh, what I heard this morning what, and during the first agenda item was compassion. I heard compassion right here from the members of this committee about a woman who was murdered recently. I heard compassion about elderly being mistreated. I heard compassion about um, children in substandard conditions. And so I'm asking you if you can find that same compassion for the stories you've heard today. There's moms and dads here who have lost children, just like the woman that died. There are moms and dads here whose children have been abused, if you will, by taking on this injection that they didn't know could harm their child because everybody said to them, vaccines are safe and effective. It won't happen to your child. I'm asking you, I know you have that compassion in you. I'm asking you to bring it to the people here and hear our stories today. I've chosen not to vaccinate my children because I kept reading and kept reading. I was waiting until I came across the document that would convince me 100% that my children would not be harmed. And that has not happened to me yet. And I will not do it until I know with 100% certainty, that if I consent, my child will not be injured in any way. Uh, what I'd like to do next is share some quotations from some medical doctors who are concerned about vaccines. There's a lot of them and I'll, I'll just share some quotations from a few of them. Vaccines are profitable, but neither safe nor effective. That's Dr. Vernon Coleman. Vaccines are highly dangerous, have never been adequately studied or proven to be effective. That's Dr. Alan Greenberg, MD. Only after realizing immunizations were dangerous did I achieve a drop in infant death rates. Dr. Archivides Kalokarinos, MD. Without exception, the vaccine program for each of the childhood diseases was begun after that disease had begun to disappear. Dr. William Douglas, MD. I vaccinated my children with the MMR before I started my research. Knowing what I now know, I would not vaccinate my children. Dr. Jane Donegan, GP. 
Many believe that the Salk and Sabin polio vaccines made from monkey kidney tissue have been responsible for the increase in leukemia, Dr. F. Klenner, MD. In my medical career, I've treated vaccinated and unvaccinated children, and the unvaccinated children are far healthier, Dr. Philip and Kao, MD. And I would like to conclude by a quote from Dr. J. Anthony Morris. He was formerly Chief Vaccine Control Officer at the FDA. There is evidence to prove that immunization of children does more harm than good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions for Shauna? Okay. Seeing none, our next speaker is Catherine Codinho. Uh, Catherine, welcome. Uh, you have three minutes whenever you're ready. Good morning. I am one of the unvaccinated students you are looking to bully, discriminate, and remove from Toronto schools. I am not sick, I am not ill, and I am not contagious. I am, however, an athlete, a member of my school's student council, an honor roll recipient, and one of the most healthy, motivated, and dedicated students at my school. I don't have the time or space to get sick because there is so much that I do and am involved in. In fact, the only time I ever take off school is to go to different athletic and academic competitions, school trips, training camps, and now, thanks to you, when I have to defend my God-given freedoms to an overstepping board of health. How could I possibly be a danger to my friends at school? How am I considered one of the top 10 health threats as stated by the World Health Organization? Last year, a girl at my school took her own life. Wouldn't it be better if Toronto Board of Health worked at taking my peers off antidepressants and anxiety medication? Wouldn't it be better to stop the suicides that are plaguing my generation? The overwhelming majority of my generation is sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you want to medicate all of us so that we all have to experience the same debilitating drug-induced diseases? If heart drugs list heart attacks as a side effect and antidepressant drugs list suicide as a side effect, why do you think I should trust anyone that says vaccines are safe and effective? Your decisions regarding the Immunization School Pupils Act affect me profoundly. I do not consent to having my medical choices on an electronic registry. I do not consent to being forced to have an exemption filed stating my opposition to being drugged. I do not consent to anyone taking my freedoms of conscience or religion. And above all, I do not consent to you mandating decisions about my body autonomy. This is my body and it is my choice. As MC Hammer once said, you can't touch this. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the, our second formal warning as it relates to noise and disturbance in the room. After the third warning, we do have to clear the room. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Kristen Owers. Is Kristen here? Or, sorry. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you. Oh, shoot. Okay. My name is Kristen, I'm an education worker, and I have a few concerns about the proposed amendments. First of all, I believe that they are unconstitutional. You've heard a lot of quotes around uh, the Constitution, which sections of the Constitution, around religion, creed, uh, right to bodily integrity, also um, uh, the Nuremberg Code, and the medical consent laws. Next, I also believe that the amendments are based on fear rather than investigation. I do not worry about students who are unvaccinated. There is no risk. There's far more risk from people who've just had a live attenuated vaccine, such as the current measles vaccine, the, uh, the nasal spray, the flu nasal spray vaccine, and also the whooping cough vaccine. And there are others that have got live attenuated uh, viruses in them. Some blame recently the recent outbreaks on children who've not been vaccinated. However, in BC, the, the majority of cases occurred in vaccinated people. In New Brunswick, the number of cases who were vaccinated and not been vaccinated have not been released. So one can only assume that those people are fully vaccinated because if they weren't vaccinated, everyone would know about it. What happens when vaccinations are mandated? In places where students have been mandated to go to Oh, sorry, in places where students have been mandated to have vaccinations, the enrollment numbers go down. California saw the largest decline in enrollment last year, 34,135 students. New York just mandated vaccinations earlier this year. New York politicians, as well as Trump, blamed the measles outbreak on Orthodox Jews. It came as no surprise that there was an attack on a synagogue that Passover. Now, why did it, was it on Passover? because that's when most people would be there. Why, would, why was it in California? 
because there's been a vaccination crusade there since 2015 where they first mandated the education sessions or re-education sessions and then and since then they've re removed all um, um, exemptions. So Ontario has followed the same model <clears throat> with similar outcomes. Since the re-education uh, camps, uh, no one, no one has been converted. Now are we going to follow the same, same model where we start to uh, look at uh, a religious group and ostracize them and wait for whatever hate crime is going to happen. Would there be a hate crime in North York or is it going to be in Ford country uh, to a, a, a mosque? Okay. Uh, if you have mandated vaccinations, people are going to need to homeschool or private school their children. <clears throat> Many people cannot <clears throat> afford that. <clears throat> <clears throat> in Italy, <clears throat> sorry, in Italy, uh, mandated vaccinations, Italy has mandated vaccinations in schools. Daycares and schools have closed down as a result. In Australia's, thank you, uh, mothers have created their own social and education networks. And you're There's just over three minutes. I'm going to ask you to finish in a sentence. Please. Okay. If, if they were mandated in TDSB, 3% of the uh, students would go. That's 7,500 7, students. That would be 930 education workers who would be out of a job. Thanks. Doug Ford's uh, cuts have only been less than, have been 285. This is far worse than Ford. Thank you. you want to make Ford look good? You're three and a half doing minutes. It. Thank you very much. There are any questions for Kristen? Okay, just before our next speaker, to members of the board, it's uh, just before 12.20, we have two more speakers. Uh, some members of the board, I understand, are going to have to leave at one. My proposal, because I know people wanted to be here for this, is that we extend to finish this item before breaking for lunch. Uh, are members of the board okay with that? Okay, so I have an amendment. Okay, that's okay. Um, we have some people who need to leave at one, um, and so I think this will get us the most number of people to be able to stay for this. Uh, so the motion is that the, no, not that one. And this is that the Board of Health extend its meeting past the 12.30 lunch break to allow the board to complete this item, at which point we'll take a, a lunch break. Um, all those in favor, opposed, if any, carried. Uh, if people do need to st step out, uh, either to make a call or use the washroom or anything, uh, you're more than welcome, of course. Okay, our next speaker is Natalie Crummer. Is Natalie here? Welcome, Natalie. Uh, put it, face it towards you, that's it. There you go. You can have a seat and when you're ready, I'll start the clock. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Sorry. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit off script as well. Um, just in the beginning, um, my name is Natalie Crummer. I am a mother, I'm a business owner. I'm also a mother of a vaccine injured child. Um, I also, I'm here to put my heart out like it's it was not it was hard for me to come I came from Kitchener which is not as far as some other people came here a lot of people took off work to come here that's how important this is no one here is getting any sort of incentives to be here no one is getting any sort of you know if anything we're losing money losing stuff from our business to be here um, it, it's I want to talk about as far as you know I'm not going to sit here and say a slogan over and over again about vaccines are safe. You know, it's really unfortunate to hear that. We, uh, it's not even making it open for discussion when you hear all these families and their stories and then someone comes up here, they're safe, they're safe, they're safe. Say that to all the other stories that came before. Like, let's have a conversation about this. It's really unfortunate that we can't even have this open conversation. It's also, it's 2019. There's access to information. There is no study that a doctor has access to that I don't also have access to. So to be like, oh, you know, your Google research. It's 2019, there's no secret studies. There's no, like there's, everything's peer reviewed. We have access to all of this information. So it, it's, that's really unfortunate to try to be like, oh, you know, cause you found that on Google. Yeah, because we don't walk around with like 10,000 books in our trunks anymore. That's where it's a PDF version of a book. That's what's frustrating. Like, let's have these conversations. Let's not just say, oh, that's misinformation because you got it off Google. So did you. That's what's frustrating. So I'm going to talk about 
I thank you very much for the person that talked about their experience of having polio as a young child. In regards to polio, I'm going to be talking about um, some information from Dr. Susan Humphrey's book as well as J.P. Hanley's book. Um, I'm not a doctor, but I'm able to do research. I can read. I can decipher. Like we, I'm a competent person. So there's no polio in Canada. The last wild natural polio case in Canada occurred in 1977. There have been three reported cases in the U.S. since 2005, all from vaccine strains of polio. Worldwide, there are more new polio cases due to vaccine strains that become virulent than there are due to wild polio viruses. Last year, vaccine-derived viruses paralyzed 105 children worldwide. The wild virus affected just 33 children. And more shockingly, and little known, is the fact that between 2000 and 2017 in India, 490,000 cases of paralysis were a direct result of the vaccine. A short history, the polio scare occurred during the 1940s and 1950s. Polio was a summer disease occurring during pesticide spraying season and has been linked to DDT, especially around apple orchards, fruit, and vegetable farms. The use of DDT in North America began in 1945. Polio infected clusters of people. Natalie, you're just over three minutes, so I'm going to ask you to wrap up okay. with the final sentence, please. Sure. Um, I'm just going to say the, one of the biggest problems that we face is the exaggerated, one-sided, fault-free history of vaccines. Um, in 1956, the Medical uh, Association instructed doctors to change the polio diagnosis. thank you very much. I'm almost done. Um, polio diagnosis to an acute flaccid paralysis diagnosis. So by changing the character of polio, the Sorry, medical Natalie, industry were able to say minutes. polio thank has been much. eradicated through a vaccination, which it has thank, not. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Natalie? Okay. Uh, our final uh, deputant today is Norma Jean McCready. Is Norma here? Welcome, Norma. My late husband, John Spall, spent his career with Toronto EMS. He managed Toronto's Ambulance Control Centre and then the Systems Performance Analysis Division. During the SARS epidemic, his team generated the stats that Toronto and Ontario used to stretch the track, track the spread of the virus. He was a statistician, an advocate for a well-designed statistical report, basing inquiry on the evidence, not what was assumed. A report that considered all pertinent data was his ultimate resource, knowing his reports informed policy decisions in the city he served. He took pride in being a civil servant. Let us follow his example and consider all available information in making our decisions. Humbly consider that you may not have all the data. Discussions in 1981, when our first child was born, on the safety and efficacy of vaccines on all mainstream media was considered acceptable. Consumers demanded full informed consent on medical procedures. Answers were sought about the DTP vaccine, which, which was withdrawn because it had so many adverse reactions. It prompted so many lawsuits in the U.S. that the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program was established. Vaccines were made liability free and the number of recommended vaccines rose exponentially. My husband handled the mail for the midwifery task force, helping the movement to legalize midwifery in Ontario, quietly, behind the scenes, as was his way. That was the kind of man he was. He cared about the environment, about social justice, about better birthing options, about the public good. He cried when Robert Jakansky was killed by a taser in the Vancouver airport. He cried when he watched Vaxxed. We weren't supposed to hear about the top CDC scientist who confessed to his role in the destruction of statistical evidence linking the age of administration of the MMR vaccine to a significant increase in the incidence of autism in African American boys. He began to speak openly about vaccine safety issues because he cared. He wanted better, as should we all. I'm now a retired educational assistant. I saw the increasing number of health, behavioral and learning issues, and the dramatic increase in, in autism. The anxious, nonverbal, stimming, kicking, screaming, headbanging children. Schools have become dangerous places. More and more special needs children appear every year as neurotypical children are becoming more scarce. A tsunami that demands answers to questions we are not allowed to ask. I have seen the carnage firsthand. It was my job to care for these children. Some don't want to acknowledge this crisis. I believe my fellow citizens when they tell me their children are fine before vaccinations. Remember nothing else we're saying, but remember this. They vaccinated their children as recommended. And things went terribly wrong, in some cases within minutes, hours, and days after vaccinations. The motion to establish a compensation system speaks to this reality.
Most adverse reactions are ignored and discounted. Crucial data points eliminated. And so we dismiss parents' reports. We know as few as 1% of adverse reactions are ever reported. These numbers are estimated to be at least 10 times higher. These accounts will not change. Voices will no longer be silent. No, right. You're Those just over three minutes. Damaged. I'm going to ask you to wrap up in a sentence, please. They will be heard. We will be heard. We all stand together. We believe sexual assault survivors. Mothers are saying their children were harmed. Believe women. Please ask yourself before you dismiss, disrespect, and discredit all of us, your fellow citizens, brave, ordinary people from every ethnicity, every income, and education level, as deluded, ill-informed, and easily swayed. Norma, you're Science just at three and a half minutes. minutes. These voices to... should matter to you, okay. to all of us. We will demand you. the freedom. Okay. Thank we will not consent. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're now going to, that's the rest of our deputations list. At this point, we're moving it into committee, uh, and this is the chance for members of the board to ask questions of staff. Uh, do I have uh, anybody with questions? Uh, Director Suwon. Thank you very much. Chair, so I have a question through you to the Medical Office of Health. There was a recommendation dealing with the College of Physician and Surgeon. So can you elaborate a little bit further, because I'm not clear in that particular I don't have it in front. Let me just read the yellow sheet. Um, there was a section there that talked about the sharing of the email address. This is the first time I've heard about this. So am I clear when I read your, your recommendation, Dr. Davilia, that the college is refusing to share? I consider that as a public information. So they are refusing to share the email addresses of physician working here in the city of Toronto and this conversation about the vaccination piece. So through the chair, uh, the short answer is, you know, what we're trying to do is get the email addresses of Toronto physicians so as to facilitate communications with them. I will ask uh, Dr. Dubé uh, about previous attempts that we have made as a department to access this information. Getting email addresses for physicians will enable us to give timely information to physicians. We do currently get lists of physicians' facts and address um, information, but we don't currently have access to email addresses, and we want to be able to have a way to uh, communicate with physicians in an efficient and timely um, manner. So my follow-up question, Mr. Chair, um, what's the rationale, because this issue here, is it the college see this as a privacy issue? Uh, because at the end of the day, this is public safety, right? So I'm just not clear, because if this is good for the city of Toronto, let's call about our colleagues across the province, because this is not just the city of Toronto issue. This is the province issue. So my question is to you, through you, Mr. Chair, to the Medical Office of Health, why is the College of Physician Surgeon not see this as public safety, public information to share with a public board? So through the chair, I'm not sure that it's appropriate for either myself or Dr. Dubé to speak to what the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario um, is thinking or what their rationale might be. Happy to have the conversation with them and let them speak for themselves, but clearly we see an importance to providing or to having the email addresses of Toronto physicians, and one might argue that there would be benefit for um, other local public health units to get email addresses for their own respective physicians to facilitate the flow of information on matters of public safety. Thank you. Thank you. Other, any other questions? Uh, Director Bowery. Um, hi, uh, love, uh, thank you very much for the report that was put together. The recommendation, one of the recommendations talks about the functionality of Panorama and uh, a couple of ways of increasing the functionality of Panorama. I wondered if you could just give us a little bit of detail on what that would look like, because as a healthcare provider myself, I think the reporting um, part of this is uh, currently a barrier for a lot of families and healthcare providers. Uh, thank you for the question. So Panorama is our um, 
the provincial system that we use electronically to house immunization data. And it's a step up from where we were previously, but it still has some um, limitations in its function. So for example, right now we cannot run coverage reports by, for example, postal code or by, for example, certain socio-demographic or social determinants of health to be able to determine where we may have pockets of under-vaccinated individuals in the city who may require more resources, for example. So that's one of the ways in which we want to increase the functionality. Another way which we have continue to be vocal on is right now it's parents who are required to report vaccinations directly to public health uh, in accordance with the Immunization School Pupils Act and it's the parents responsibility. Currently there is legislation that is on hold requiring physicians and other health care providers to report directly to public health and so that's another one of the recommendations that if we got the immunization informa information shortly after it, the immunization was provided in the office directly to public health, well then it would take the burden off parents and it would also allow us for more real time uh, data and analysis of immunization rates. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Director McKelvey and then I have uh, Director Le uh, Leighton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is for the Chief Medical Officer. Can you just um, outline how your recommendations interface with those coming out of the World Health Organization and in particular the Salzburg Statement on Vaccine Acceptance? Uh, the World Health Organization has recognized uh, the role of the internet and social media sites on um, influencing um, some of the information that's available, some of the false information that's available. We included the recommendation from the Salzburg Report um, Group because it was a comprehens comprehensive recommendations made up of a number of different health specialists and consistent with the information or recommendations that the World Health Organization is also making and seem to play to um, specific interventions that these uh, social media platforms and search engines can actually do to improve the public's health. So your recommendations are consistent with what's starting to be done internationally? Well, right now the recommendation is for the search engines and social media platforms to make the changes of their own. And so it's kind of a self-regulation or um, a recommendation that they make the changes. There currently is no, for example, legislation or um, anything beyond a recommendation coming out forcing these um, platforms to make the changes. And then just, uh, I just want the words that are used throughout are request and consider, and I see that over and over again. So it looks like ultimate authority here is with the province and the federal government for some of these recommendations that you have? That's right. So the ones that say consider or recommend, it's where the jurisdiction to make the decision does not lie with Toronto Public Health. It's either the Ministry of Health, federal government, or internationally. Okay. And then uh, the last is regarding the recommendation 1B. Um, about uh, removing exemptions, um, you aren't recommending to remove medical exemptions, right? That's right. The, it's a, first of all, it's consider the removal of philosophical and religious exemptions, but those who have a medical reason for not being vaccinated would continue to uh, maintain their medical exemption. As they should. As is, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next I have Director Layton. Yes, thank you very much. And continuing on that, that line of questions from Director McKelvey, um, the report on page 9 demonstrates a doubling in the exemptions rates over the last decade, but then it says we're, we haven't quite hit the rate of dangerous levels of exemptions. Is there any idea of what that rate is? We know for different diseases, different what we call herd immunity rates are required. So for example, for something like measles, typically 95% of the population needs to be considered immune. So either vaccinated or protected because they previously had measles. And so right now our rates in schools are 94% among vaccinated individuals. So for something like measles, you know, having 5% medical exemption rate might be too high and could result in outbreaks. In places like California, there were instances where medical exemption rates were, for example, 10% and definitely resulted in outbreaks. Uh, so it depends on the disease, what that particular um, uh, kind of worrisome spot is. But 
for something like measles, you do not need a lot of medical exemptions in order to have pockets of unvaccinated individuals leading to outbreaks. And we measure the, the exemption rates citywide? Not Those are Toronto rates, but the rates have also been shown, uh, this uh, same pattern has also been shown in Ontario in general. And as a response, it says here that California took action to remove their non-medical exemptions, correct? When was that? Uh, that was recently, in the past uh, year or two, uh, when, uh, when California removed their non-medical exemption. Uh, and there have been studies that have subsequently shown that the removal of the non-medical exemption rates have subsequently resulted in higher immunization rates in the schools. Now, can I just, and just one last line of question around compensation, the injury compensation program. It's existed in Quebec for 40 years? Quebec has had a vaccine injury compensation program for that long, and that was material that was included in the report. No other province in Canada has gone ahead or, or has even, I don't know if they've contemplated or has one anyways. Is there a rationale for why? why it hasn't been established in other jurisdictions? I believe Quebec has a history for why they went ahead with it 40 years ago, um, and I'm not clear on why other provinces have not, um, do not have one at currently. Oh, through the chair, I, however, I, I would add that uh, there, there has been active conversation, and in fact, it's been um, in the medical literature and amongst public health circles talking about the notion of a compensation program for many, many years now. Okay, yeah. thank, you. Pharma doesn't pay. thank you very much. Oh, ladies and gentlemen in the public, this is the absolute final warning. Uh, we will have to clear the gallery uh, in order to carry on if there is another outburst. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Trustee Lepretti. Um, through you, Chair, to staff, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the recommendation number four, provide financial incentives to promote vaccinations for local health care providers. Um, absolutely. So uh, the Ministry of Health, or uh, the Ontario government, recently, re recently released an ending hallway medicine plan. And in there, it included a number of recommendations, such as um, engaging Health Quality Ontario to provide physicians with some of their metrics for some of the um, the way they're responding to the, their population and meeting some of the health care needs. And in that report, it said that one another way in which Ontario can move forward to achieve good health outcomes is to provide financial, financial incentive to physicians. And so what so that was something that was included in the Ending Hallway Medicine Report. And so if the Ministry is considering providing financial incentives for physicians, for example, who have high rates of X, Y, or Z, this would be one area in which they could also consider providing financial incentives. So it was in that context that this recommendation was made. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I have two questions. Um, to our Medical Officer of Health, in your opinion, as our, as our Medical Officer of Health, are vaccines safe? So through you, Mr. Chair, I don't think I can say it any better than it's stated in the report. Vaccines are safe, they're effective, and they are truly one of the most important contributors to improving health worldwide. You will see also in the report that there are rare instances where serious reactions can occur but that doesn't take away from the fact that they are one of the most significant life-saving interventions that has occurred in medical history. And my second question is, given the rise in vaccine hesitancy that we have documented, that you have documented in the report, does that necessitate a scaled up approach and strategy from all levels of government to tackle vaccine hesitancy? In short, yes, and that's why we've put these recommendations in front of the board for your consideration today. Thank you, so all my questions. We're going to move in towards speakers. Speakers, I have Director Pertz. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, as, as some of you may know, uh, for about 20 years before entering elected office, I worked in the environmental movement, particularly in the area of human health and the environment. Uh, I taught that subject at the University of Toronto. I studied it as an undergraduate student. And in doing that work, I learned to think about topics like this requires great care. One of the things that I've heard today several times is this notion of body autonomy. And I think it's very important that we interrogate that and understand that. 
first of all, biologically speaking, there is no such thing. Every human being trades bacteria, viruses, genetic information with other human beings all the time. If you live in a society, that's a fact. Another piece, though, that isn't thought about as carefully is that the results of human action are constantly interfering with our health. From the moment of conception, we're all exposed to persistent organic pollutants that are the result of the chemical industry. Every breath that we take contains uh, emissions from the, the fossil fuel industry. Every moment of every day, from your first breath to your last, human action is affecting your health. The idea that there's some state you can achieve of bodily autonomy where human actions don't impact your health is uh, a false dream. It's something that if you allow to lead your thinking about how you look at issues like vaccination, you will be led to a wrong conclusion. The problem we have, in my view, is that we don't make enough intentional interventions in human impact on human health. Prior to the rise of public health, 40% of all children born did not make it to adulthood. 40%. Some say 40, some say 50, but I'll take 40, it's the lower number. We are, we are sitting here in a moment of extraordinary luck and privilege that we don't have the epidemic of uh, childhood and mortality that everybody prior to the rise of public health and interventions experienced throughout the globe. Every family lost a child. Many families lost all of their children. But interventions like treating drinking water, and vaccination, thinking about nutritious food, educating young girls in sexual health, these public health interventions are the reason that we have the civilization where we can sit and argue about vaccination. If anything, we need to be more aggressive about having public discussions of what we can do collectively to protect health, not fewer. If anything, we must do more to dispel the myth that it is possible to live with some kind of bodily autonomy. It's not biologically practical or possible. There is no human being alive whose health hasn't been impacted by human intervention and there never will be. We have to do it with intention instead of simply wishing we could live in some pristine state which none of us ever has lived in and none of us ever will live in. I salute the courage of the, the, the medical officer of health and the health professionals that we've heard today for standing up for this important principle despite the concerns that many have raised today. It's hard to do, but it's necessary if we want to have a healthy population. So I will be supporting the recommendations in front of us. Thank you, Director Perks. Uh, others to speak? Uh, Director Siwon. So this issue is very personal for me. As some of you know, I was a former public health nurse. I was also that immigrant kid who experienced much many racism in the city, and I still experienced it before I came here as your colleague on this board. I'm voting for these recommendations, Mr. Chair, because of that little girl whose classmate in Hong Kong was suffered from polio. I remember this little girl couldn't climb in the playground. This issue that we are confronting with today no different than what we, this board, passed when I was here, when Council Leighton's father and I debated on tobacco. This issue was also the similar issue when we, I was here on this board, when we debated on fluoride, right, Council Perk, remember that? So if the intent of this board, our legislative responsibility, education, awareness, and prevention, we have to do the right thing. This is no different than we did in this board led when it comes to tobacco strategy. This board led on, the, on that issue because I was around back in the 80s as a young public health nurse. So when I vote today on these motions and the chair's 
newest one that, that to come before us. I'm voting for that little girl who couldn't climb. She was my classmate when I was in Hong Kong. So we need to address those issues. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director. Um, any other speakers? Okay. Uh, I'll speak then, and first of all, I'm going to, I will be moving the staff recommendations, and I have an amendment as well, if it can be placed on the screen, uh, which is to request Health Canada introduce legislation to restrict inaccurate and misleading anti-vaccine messaging that is targeted to the public. Let me begin first of all, uh, and I, I have moved the staff recommendations, by thanking our staff for their tremendous hard work uh, and for their proactive work, as well to the deputants, all the deputants, for being here and for talking and coming to speak to us. But if anybody had any question as to whether tackling vaccine hesitancy was an urgent issue, and one that the WHO has said is one of the top 10 issues facing the globe, I think this morning demonstrated that we have work to do. Let me be very clear. As our medical officer of health has stated, vaccines work, full stop. There is an abundance of scientifically proven evidence demonstrating just that. In fact, vaccines have saved more children's lives than any other healthcare intervention in human history. And they have indeed eliminated once deadly diseases and drastically reduced the risk of others. So why are we here? We are here because in 2019, in the 21st century, vaccine hesitancy is on the rise. Where we have across the United States and in Europe measles outbreaks leading to deaths. And in Canada, where we have 20%, 20% in this city of parents who are vaccine hesitant. And we also have a rise in false and misleading advertising. And the risk is clear. The risk is clear for herd immunity, but the risk is also clear today for kids, for pregnant women, and for people who are immunocompromised. And so at the Toronto Board of Health, in this society, as the chair of the board, I'm not prepared to wait for an outbreak. I'm not prepared to wait to act. Rather, based on the research and the evidence and the trends, we are seeking to proactively work to prevent that outbreak. That's what this report is. In April, when we asked our, our staff to come forward with proposals for a comprehensive approach, we did this because we've already seen in California, in Washington, in New York, states have been forced to respond after the fact. What public health is fundamentally about is prevention. This is an upstream action that's required, and it requires all levels of government at the city for us to engage in more public education with healthcare professionals and students and the public, with the province to improve and, in, and implement an improved online data system, and to consider removing the non-medical exemptions, and for the federal government to look at the risk around advertising, and for the private sector and the social media companies to treat these the same they do with other misleading advertisements. Now, some have said that vaccinations are an infringement on individual rights. Well, people have the fundamental right to believe what they want, but they do not have the right to endanger others. At Toronto Public Health, we will expedite our work to promote and defend vaccinations, and in 2019, in the 21st century, we will once again work to not only defend science, but to protect the health and well-being of our society. Uh, I'd like, are people comfortable taking the, the, uh, a vote on the package? Or do you want to separate them out? No, no, we can do the one separate if you would like that. It's a school board related one? Number four. Okay, so for the clerks, so we're, there is a, 1A4, 1A4, provide financial incentives to promote vaccinations for local health care providers. You want to vote on that one separately? Okay, so we're going to vote on that, uh, and then we're going to take the rest as a package, if that's all right? Okay, so on recommendation 1A4, all right, all those in favor? Opposed, if any, thank you. On the package as a whole, then, now that we voted on that, uh, I'd ask for a recorded vote on this, please. All those in favor? <coughs> Director, Director Ash Navari, Director Stephanie Donaldson, Director Angela Johnson, 
Director Cynthia Lai, Director Mike Layton, Director Kristen Wong Tam, Director Joe Cressy, Director Lepretti, Director Jennifer McKelvey, Director Kate Mulligan, Director Gord Perks, Director Peter Wong, Director Sue Wong. That's unanimous. Uh, members of the boards, we will now we will now adjourn until 1:30 for a lunch break. 1:30 for a lunch break. Thank you.